Howdy! This is the Ancient World Mysteries Osberg Mega Video. I initially recorded this in three separate parts, that's why I'm recording this intro. So if you've already seen uh, parts 1, 2, and 3, you don't have to watch this. It's the same videos, I just smushed them all together so it'd be easier if new viewers were to come across this and see it so they wouldn't have to go from part 1 to 2 to 3. And also I wanted to comment and say in part 1, my acne looks god-awful. I got on Accutane since then, god bless you for whoever made that drug. It works, it works wonders. My face doesn't look like a pizza anymore. Anyways, I'm not here to praise Big Pharma. Just wanted to let you know what's going on. Hop straight into the video. It'll start with part one, then part two, then part three. All the Tom stamps will be there. Enjoy! Today I'm going to be explaining the Ancient World Mysteries Osberg, and by the time I'm done, you're going to be feeling like Jimmy Neutron with all the brain blasts you're going to be having. And since Thanksgiving's right around the corner, I couldn't think of a better time to stuff you with all this ancient information. And <laughs> by the way, this video is going to be divided up into three separate parts, because if you'll notice, the Osberg has 20 entries for each level, and there is six levels, so there's a whole lot of information to get through. So let's go ahead and hop into level one and start out with Atlantis. The sunken city of Atlantis, best portrayed in Spongebob. It was the tale of a lost city written by the great Plato himself. Now, you all probably know the name, but just in case you aren't familiar with the city itself, it was said to be founded by half-human, half-god entities, and the city was developed into a utopia and then a great naval power. And the formation of the city adds to the mystery as well, because it was made up of concentric islands separated by large moats. Unfortunately, not full of alligators, though, and drawbridges, but anyways, they were all linked by a canal that went directly to the center of the city, where a great capital city stood. And according to stories from the time, the islands were full of precious metals like gold and silver and exotic animals as well. Truly just a paradise on earth, it seemed. But if it sounds too good to be true, it most likely isn't. Because the location of this city was never really stated, and most historians tend to agree that Atlantis never existed in the first place. Because even at the time that Plato wrote the story about Atlantis, it was already 9,000 some years in the past, and he was retelling it from just what he'd heard about it. There was no written documents passed down through the generations, it was pretty much just word of mouth, so he was writing it as if he was hearing it as a legend. But just because Atlantis didn't exist, that doesn't mean other civilizations that were very similar didn't exist and inspire this fantastical tale of this magical city known as Atlantis. That's very possible, and it probably is true as well. But that also hasn't stopped conspiracy theorists from speculating and exploring and snooping around all in hopes of finding this mystical land. Unfortunately though, it was to no avail, but maybe one day we'll explore 100% of our oceans and find out once and for all if Atlantis really existed or if it's just another mystery of our past. Late Bronze Age Collapse The collapse of late Bronze Age civilizations has been something that has made archaeologists continually scratch their heads because it's a mystery that seems to have left little to no clues. But to back it up a bit, it's in reference to the collapse of the civilizations throughout the Levant, near the Middle East, and the Mediterranean around 3200 years ago. All of these advanced civilizations seemingly disappeared overnight, and while no concrete evidence has ever come forward on that issue, there is a leading theory that has some credibility, and it states that the downfall of these civilizations began with an invasion of ancient Egypt in 1177 BCE by a group known only as the Sea People. And while Ramses III was able to defeat these invaders, ancient Egypt was never the same after the attack, and it steeply declined along with many other of the surrounding cities. One archaeologist likened the decline of these civilizations to dominoes falling one after another very suddenly, and archaeologists are finding all kinds of destruction events that they relate to this time period of seemingly pure abandonment and destruction. Because it seems, because it seems like in humanity's history, Oracle of Delphi, aka Pythia, was the priestess who held court at Pitho, the sanctuary of the Delphinians. It was a sanctuary dedicated to the Greek god Apollo, and Pythia were highly regarded, for it was believed that she channeled prophecies from Apollo himself while being steeped in a dreamlike trance. The Pythia priestess began her work in the 7th century BC, 
and continued to be consulted until the late 4th century AD. And during this time, she was the highest authority among the oracles, but also one of the most powerful women of the classical world. And in present times, oracles are one of the most well-documented religious institutions of classical Greece. Stonehenge, you most likely already know what this is, but it's a prehistoric monument on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, Witch England. <laughs> It consists of an outer ring of vertical standing stones, which are each around 13 feet tall and 7 feet wide. Each one of the stones as well weighs around 25 tons, and they're topped by horizontal lintel stones. And I was shocked to find out that the stones were that big. Like, I knew they were big before, but when I was researching it, it really shocked me that they weighed that much and were that tall and wide. Just to put it into perspective, an elephant weighs about 3 to 4 tons, so these stones weigh about three to four elephants. But now to get into the mysteries of Stonehenge, one of the weirdest parts of it is that the massive monument is aligned toward the sunrise on the summer solstice, I can't speak English, and it's also lined up to the sunset of the winter solstice. Solstice. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not cutting that out. I want you to see how much I struggle with that word. But archaeologists believe that Stonehenge was constructed sometime between 3000 BC and 2000 BC. And since the people who built Stonehenge left behind no written documents of their culture or anything or how they built it, this has left many to speculate on how it was constructed. Some say they shouldn't have had the technology to do something like this and they think aliens did it obviously because, you know... <laughs> History Channel, man. Ancient aliens, they're everywhere. If there's a mystery that happened a long time ago, ancient aliens did it. And actually, some theories have been put to the test to see if, like, they could have done something like this during that time period. And they have been proven to be pretty effective at moving these stones. One such method was rolling the stones on logs, which turned out to be, you know, something they could have done back then. But personally, I think that Bob the Builder and Handy Mandy came together on this to build their magnum opus. The Spear of Longinus, Longinus, I don't know how to say that word whatsoever, but it's more widely known as the Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny, so that's what I'll refer to it as. But this is said to be the spear that pierced the side of Jesus while he was being crucified. The spear is mostly shrouded in mystery though, big shocker. <laughs> being in the same legendary category as the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail. And several countries have claimed ownership of the spear. Most of them have been proven fake, but there are three main contenders that kind of seem like they could be the real deal. But the most popular and credible of the three, the only one that could really have a chance of being the real deal, is in Vienna, Austria, and experts ran tests on the spear and claimed that it was old enough to be the spear, but still don't have enough evidence to say for sure and most likely never will. Where was the Star of Bethlehem? So this is another entry from the biblical lore. It comes from the book of Matthew, I believe, and the star is what led the three wise men to the, the birth site of Jesus Christ when he was born to Mary and Joseph in a manger, surrounded by all those animals, of course. And the debate of what this star actually could be has kept scholars debating for quite some time, but the leading theory is that if it actually existed, it could have been the Great Conjugation, which actually happened back on December 21st of 2020, which is more importantly, my 18th birthday. So that's another reason why that day is pretty spectacular. And also, the fact that the Great Conjugation won't happen again for another 800 years is also kind of special, I guess. But <laughs> the Great Conjugation is when Jupiter and Saturn come so close together that from Earth, it almost looks like one object in space. But some other theories about the Star of Bethlehem say that it could have been a supernova, a comet, a solar flare, an alignment of planets similar to the Great Conjugation, or that it simply never happened at all. And you're going to come to soon find out that with all these entries, you're going to pretty much have to make the decision yourself. They're ancient mysteries for a reason. There's no concrete evidence. Zoroaster and Zoroastrianism. I don't know how to say that word. It's a word I can't pronounce, but more importantly, it's an ancient religion that is still being practiced to this day. But let's do a little bit of time traveling and go back to where it all started with the prophet Zarathustra, or Zoroaster in Greek. Scholars generally believe that he lived sometime between 1500 and 1000 BC, and before him, Persians worshipped deities of the old Irano-Aryan religion, but Zarathustra condemned this practice and preached that Ahra Mazda, the god of wisdom, 
was the only god they should be worshipping. I'm sorry, I, I know it sounded very much so like I was reading from, from note cards right there, and it's because I was. If I didn't write down every bit of that, I would not have been able to pronounce it or get through that whatsoever. But by him doing this, saying that they should be only worshipping this one god, he introduced mankind to the first monotheistic religion. And not only did this monotheistic idea lead the way for religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it also introduced duality ideas like heaven and hell, the final revelation of the world, judgment day, and even angels and demons were all teachings of Zarathustra. And believe it or not, even the concept of Satan was introduced by this religion. And then you have all these other monotheistic religions that came along and stole all his ideas and spat in his face without even citing their sources. P.S. It's also inspired things like Star Wars and Game of Thrones and even Frederick Nietzsche. Thought that was cool. Exact location of Jesus' tomb. So just in case you don't know, this also comes from the biblical lore when Jesus was crucified and then on the third day, Easter morning, he was resurrected and rolled the stone away from his tomb and started walking around like nothing ever happened. He was out there like, Sup Martha? Sup George? Sup Judas? You remember what you did? Bet you do. But anyways, this is pretty much in the same category as the Spear of Destiny because it's been narrowed down to three potential locations, none of which can 100% be confirmed as well. But the three tombs are called Tal Talpiot Family Tomb, the Garden Tomb, and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And although it is said to be impossible to have undeniable proof on if these tombs are the real deal, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher has the most early archaeological and literary evidence to support it being the most likely location. So while it's still the most likely out of the three, you know, nothing's 100%. Speaking of the Bible, though, I'm getting blinded by the holy lot right now. I don't know. I'm going to leave it, though. It looks kind of cool. You know, I got my arm shining. <laughs> but our next entry is Linear A. And this is an ancient writing system used by the Minoans of Crete from 1800 to 1450 BC and they used it to write the Minoan languages. It was primarily used for religious and palace writings, and the mystery about this language, though, is that none of it has ever been deciphered because there are such little reference points to go on. And you can look at it and see that it looks kind of wacky, kind of zany, kind of looks like wingdings a bit, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's about it. <laughs> Sea Peoples. The Sea People are a hypothesized seafaring confederation that attacked ancient Egypt, like I mentioned in the Lost Bronze Age, Bronze Age Civilization entry, and they also attacked other places in the East Mediterranean prior to and during the Late Bronze Age. The origins of the Sea People are undocumented, but there are many theories as to where they did originate from. Some say they came from places like Asia Minor, Aegean, the Mediterranean Islands, and even Southern Europe. And they are thought to have sailed around the Eastern Mediterranean and invaded Anatolia, Syria, Fuentia, Canaan, Cyprus, and Egypt towards the end of the Bronze Age. So I guess they were just hungry little sea goblins that loved the spoils of war. The Nazca Lines. These are a group of geoglyphs made in the sands of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru that stretch about 1,000 square kilometers, and they're very similar to crop circles in the fact that they just make random shapes and figures and whatnot in the geography that they are located in. But these lines make up nearly 300 different figures, including animals and plants, and they were created sometime between 500 BCE and 500 CE. And the most accepted reason as to why they made all these intricate lines was to please their deities that they worshipped as a sort of an offering. So like if they wanted a good harvest, they would draw something real wacky like a little dog or something in the, the sands, and then they think their god would see that and be like, oh, that's a cute puppy. Have a good harvest, here's some rain. But all ancient mysteries aside, they look very cool, and I believe you can even go on tours to see them, like today. Okay, I give in, finally, I give in. The lot's getting to be too much. Look at that, look at my hand. This one looks like a holy hand, and this looks like a dirty hand. This is my masturbating hand, but, but nonetheless, I'm gonna close the shade. Is that better? Hopefully that's better, but now let's get into the Trojan War. This was an epic story told in the Iliad by Homer, the non-yellow one, by the way. But in this war, there are heroes, gods, and kingdoms all fighting against each other. And while most of the story is seen as fiction, some people think that there is a little truth sprinkled in, although it would be nearly impossible to separate it and figure out the fact from the fiction. And the war, if it actually did happen, would have taken place sometime between 1194 and 1184 BCE. And the main characters of this tale 
that are also involved in the war somewhat are Helen of Troy, Melanus, Agamemnon, Achilles, Paris, Hector, and Odysseus. And while some of them are most definitely creations, creations of Homer, like Odysseus, that doesn't take away from the amazing world that Homer put to paper. Man, the sun gods really hate me today. Look at that. There's still even a little strand of sun left when I put the shade down. That's, that's crazy. Any hoozy, back to the biblical lore. When was Jesus born? Everyone is aware that Jesus' birthday is celebrated on December 25th. And now I love me some good Christmas because that means family, food, and presents above all. But as for Jesus' birthday, I have heard that it actually wasn't on Christmas because of shepherds still being in their fields or something. They think it would have taken place sometime in the spring, I believe. But anyways, no scholar knows the exact date of Jesus' birth, or even if there was a birth in the first place. But they estimate that it would have been between 6 BC and 4 BC, based partly on the biblical story of King Harold the Great. But they also debate the month and the day of Jesus' birth, subcat, because the point of reference for that would have been the Great Conjugation, they say it would have taken place on June 2nd during that time, so his birth would have been around that time as well. But just like everything else, we'll probably never know for sure. We definitely won't know for sure. Unless Jesus himself descends from heaven and says, Hello, peasants. My birthday was on April the 3rd, actually. Then we'll know for sure. Where is the tomb of Alexander the Great, and how did he die? This is once again a tomb that has been attested in many historical documents, much like Jesus, but nobody knows the exact location. Following Alexander's death in Babylon, he was buried in Memphis before it was transferred to Alexandria, where he was then reburied. And that burial site in Alexandria was thought to be possibly destroyed in the 4th century AD, and since the 19th century there have been over 100 attempts to try and identify the, uh, the ancient site of Alexander's tomb in Alexandria, but to no avail. And as for how he died, the most likely reason for his death was either malaria or typhoid fever, both of which were rampant in ancient Babylonia. Hanging Gardens of Babylonia. These were described as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They were described as an amazing architectural feat, with an ascending series, series of tiered gardens containing a wide variety of trees, shrubs, and vines, resembling a large green mountain constructed of mud bricks. But here's the line you've all been waiting for. It's still unclear as to whether these things actually existed or if they were just a poetic creation. The artist depictions I've seen of these things, though, pretty bonkers. If they were real, that would be a really cool place to hang out. Pretty chill, pretty mellow. Moa, I think is how you pronounce that, but these are more monolithic statues that are kind of similar to Stonehenge in the fact that they're massive stones, but these were carved into shapes somewhat resembling humans with large heads, and you're probably familiar with these as well because they're more widely known as the Easter Island heads because they're on Easter Island, and they were supposedly carved uh, between the years 1250 and 1500, and in total there are 900 of these statues right around that number, which is... Uh, once again, ridiculous. That absolutely blew my mind when I heard there were 900 of these things. I thought there was like 20, uh, like a baker's dozen or something. No way. I didn't think there were 900. That's like an army. That's a literal army of Easter Island heads. And there are also your standard template theories of them not having the technology to transport these massive stones such long distances to carve them and let alone that many of them. But by far the best use of these things is in Night of the Living Museum. When they say, dum dum, give me some gum gum. Sodom and Gomorrah. This is another biblical tale. We might as well have done the biblical iceberg, but Sodom and Gomorrah were two legendary biblical cities that were destroyed by fire and brimstone from God because of their wickedness. He threw a bit of a tempy tantrum. But before God destroyed the cities, he did send two angels down before the destruction to advise all good men to get out. And, you know, screw the rest. But this parallels many other stories where the theme is don't disobey God or face his temper tantrum, like the flooding of the earth, for example. And these stories were later used in the Bible and the New Testament as symbols of human wickedness and divine retribution. So you don't be wicked or you face damnation.
The Queen of Sheba also comes from the Bible. She was a biblical character who was a powerful queen that visited King Solomon. But of course, the question as to whether she actually existed or not, get ready for it, is up for debate. She's one of the most famous biblical characters though, but there still is surprisingly little known about her. Nobody knows where she came from, it doesn't even mention her name, and it never states where her kingdom is. All are very important traits of a, you know, a queen. You know, you should probably know her name and where she rules. <laughs> But there are two strands of historical evidence that tie her to two different sides of the sea. The Islam and Arabic sources say that her name was Bilqis and ruled over a kingdom on the southern Arabian Peninsula. And then the other side of the sea, the Ethiopian side, their records say that her name was Makeda and she ruled the Aksad Empire in northern Ethiopia. So unless concrete evidence comes out, She'll remain a mystery, which I think a character shrouded in a bit of mystery is more interesting than a character you know everything about down to their last nut hair. What knowledge may have been lost at the Library of Alexandria? This is one of my favorite entries on this iceberg because it's a very intriguing thought experiment, if nothing else. But anyways, historically speaking, this library stood in, in Egypt for 300 years after it was commissioned by Ptolemy 1 and 2, early in the 2nd century BC, and its goal was to store practically all written knowledge in existence within its walls. They even eventually had to build a sister library next to it because the main one got so full. And historians claim that there were 700,000 books that were lost when the library burnt down. And while we have no idea what the content of these books were, that's where our imagination comes into play and stuff like, what if they knew the meaning of life, or what if they made the everlasting boner pill come into play? And that's what really gets your brain, your gears turning. But unfortunately, we'll never know the answer to that question because it was burnt down by Julius Caesar in 48 BC. There's also a saying that the library being burnt down set humanity back about 100 years. But some scholars disagree with this and say that it's a wild exaggeration because they said it most likely they stored content that was like lesser useful works of literature and it wasn't like societally impactful stuff they had in there now our last entry on level one here is where was the garden of eden i don't think i don't think i have to say it at this point but it's another biblical entry <laughs> and according to the bible the garden of eden was located on the east side of a region called well eden also, according to the Bible, the garden was a beautiful place that was supplied with water from four different rivers, and it also had a lush garden. And apparently the garden also contained gold, bdellium, and onyx stones, as well as well-watered trees. Sounds like quite the paradise indeed. But the biggest point people use to try to find and locate where the Garden of Eden is, is by locating the rivers that branched out into four other rivers known as the Fisfan, the Gihon, the Tigris and the Euphrates. But the problem with that is that two of those rivers don't even exist now, and they maybe never even did. And if we're going based on the biblical lore, there was kind of a worldwide flood that probably did a number on the geography of the world, making it pretty much impossible to pinpoint the actual location where the garden existed. So, once again, say the line, Derek! It's likely that we'll never find the location because it may have never even existed. Time to dive deeper. Let's go into level two with the first entry, Cambyses Lost Army. I swear I can't pronounce most of these names. You're going to have to forgive me. I have a very ancestral tongue. I'm from West Virginia. Please find it in your heart to forgive me. But this lost army dates back to 524 BC when Persian Emperor Cambyses supposedly sent an army of 50,000 men to attack and enslave the Ammonians. But then we come to find out from Herodotus, Her Herodotus, an ancient historian, that the entire army vanished after a violent sandstorm. So, where did they go? That's the question that scholars and internet scholars have been trying to figure out for ages. And the theories range from it never happened to there's an army buried under the sand. And also, some people think that Her Herodotus may have been fed false information or that Herodotus could have just made this entire thing up to make Cambyses look bad. <laughs> I, sound, I feel so dumb saying those names when I don't know if I'm pronouncing them right. Etruscan Civilization and Its Origin. 
The Etruscan civilization was developed by the people of, you guessed it, Etrusa, in ancient Italy, with a common language and culture that formed a federation of city-states. They were known for their rich mineral resources and being a major Mediterranean trading power, but sadly, much of its culture and even its history have been obliterated or assimilated from its conqueror, Rome. However, their origins are a topic of much debate. Many think the Etruscans were eastern peoples transplanted to northern Italy due to a famine, and revisiting with our old friend Herodotus, he wrote that they were originally from Lydia in Anatolia, but this whole period of time is very chaotic, so it's hard to pinpoint their exact origin. Helicopter hieroglyphics, exactly what it says. Some people think that this ancient mural shows technology that was way ahead of its time. This mural originates from the temple of Seti I in Abydos, and has gave conspiracy nerds boner fuel for their wacky theories about ancient Egyptians being time travelers, and I'm sure this gave History Channel a good couple episodes of ancient aliens content. But the reality of the mural is much less grand compared to the time travel theory, and it has to do with us as humans seeing patterns where patterns don't really exist. Also known as pareidolia, we do it all the time when we see faces and stuff in clouds or like Jesus in a piece of bread or whatever, but what the mural actually depicts has to do with the legacies of different rulers in ancient Egypt, where it was common for a new ruler to re-carve an area that had already been carved, so these are really just two different images on top of each other, unfortunately. <laughs> ancient helicopters and UFOs would have been pretty dope. Plague of Athena. This plague killed tens of thousands in 430 BC, nearly a third of the population actually, but its cause is still unknown. <laughs> I, I get a chuckle every time I'm saying that. It began when people started falling ill with a disease no one had encountered before in the port of Athens. And the disease was spreading quickly and reports of the same disease were heard in places like the island of Lemnos in North Aegean and a few other locations as well. A rumor of the time was that people thought the Spartans had poisoned the wells and drinking water was the cause of all this sickness. And in a matter of weeks, it had spread to pretty much everyone in the city, affecting everyone from every walk of life. And the main source of information about the epidemic comes from the historian Thucydides, who not only witnessed the events firsthand, but survived the disease himself. And the direct quote from him is, People in good health were all of a sudden attacked by heats in the head and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts such as the throat or tongue becoming bloody and emitting unnatural and foetid breath. He also states that patient skin was a reddish livid and breaking out into small pustules and ulcers. So it was a pretty gnarly disease. And all of these symptoms of accounts from the disease lead modern scholars to think it sounds a lot like Ebola, but confirming this disease would need DNA, which isn't exactly accessible from the 5th century BC. So the exact disease shall remain a mystery. Shrunken heads. This one's a bit of nightmare fuel, fair warning. Shrunken heads are decapitated human heads that are prepared in a special way for display for certain occasions. They are a mystery from ancient times that we still see practiced today in certain native tribes, but the purpose behind creating and keeping shrunken heads has balanced between magic, sacrifice, trophy, ritual, and trade from time to time. What? But they were most commonly used to scare off and warn enemies, and it's only the Yavaro from northern Peru and southern Ecuador people who practice this horrific art and craft. Now, as for how it's made, uh, if you have a weak stomach, get ready. They start by decapitating an enemy's head and bringing, bringing it to a place of worship where they would sew the eyes and mouth shut. Once this is all done, the heads are then put into a big pot over a fire, like a witch's cauldron top deal, and left to boil for a specific amount of time. The heat and pressure from consistent boiling shrunk the skull and helped separate the skin and flesh from the bone. Then the skin and the hair of the head would be carefully separated from the skull, which was very important for the final look of the sansas, which is an al uh, alternate name for these things. The remaining flesh on the skull would also be scraped off as well. And then the skin slit used to remove the skull would then be sewn closed with care after turning it inside out. 
And I may or may not show you an image. I'm probably going to show you an image. It'll probably be up here the whole time while I'm talking about it. It's pretty haunting. It's pretty scary. So bada bing, bada boom. You'll now have a nightmare tonight. Just look at that face. Look at that head. Nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. Frescoes inside the Villa of Mysteries. The Villa of Mysteries is a well-preserved suburban ancient Roman villa on the outskirts of Pompeii, southern Italy. This villa is famous for the series of exquisite frescoes in one room which are usually thought to show the initiation of a young, young woman into a Greco-Roman mystery cult. These are now among the best known of the relatively rare survivals of ancient Roman painting from the 1st century BC. And a fresco, just for explanation, is a technique of mural painting executed by using freshly laid plaster. For example, the Creation of Adam by Michelangelo is a fresco. But the frescoes in the Villa of Mysteries date back all the way to 70 through 60 BC, and their interpretation is what is actually the mystery. As I mentioned above, most people believe it depicts a woman undergoing initiation into a Dionysian mystery, a mystery cult that was dedicated to a god known to the Romans as Bacchus. Another popular theory, though, is that it depicts a woman undergoing the rites of marriage. So it's pretty much up for interpretation. Why do so many mythologies have flood myths? You've probably heard your fair share of these flood myths. Most notably to me is the flood depicted in the Bible where Noah built his ark to repopulate the earth after this catastrophe. But there are parallels between most of these flood myths in that a good majority of them include an angry god and a catastrophic event that destroys the world, leaving only few to survive. But let's rewind the clock a bit to perhaps the first ever known flood myth from the ancient Mesopotamia. It's written in the Epic of Gilgamesh and was written on 12 stone tablets. And Gilgamesh in this story was a king who served for 126 years. Yeah, pretty old. You thought your grandma was old. But after the death of a friend, he was searching for the secret to immortality when he met an immortal man named Utnafism. But this immortal man's story is very similar to Noah's from the Bible because he was granted immortality after building a ship, a ship called the Preserver of Loth and surviving the Great Flood, where on board were his relatives and all species of creatures. And some other civilizations that had these similar flood stories were the Aztecs, the Greeks, there's a Hindu one, a Buddhist one, a Chinese one, a Norse one, and even the Aborigines had one, as well as the o Ojibwe tribe. They had one as well. Now, obviously, they aren't all as similar as the Epic of Gilgamesh and the biblical story I first mentioned, although the Gilgamesh story was written first, so the Bible just kind of copied off of ancient Mesopotamia's papers, but it's still very interesting to learn that all these very different cultures had such similar stories to tell. Fostos Disc. This is a disc formed from fired clay from the Minoan palace of Phaistos on the island of Crete, dating back to the middle or late Minoan Bronze Age. It's about six inches in diameter and was discovered back in 1908 by the Italian archaeologist Luigi Pernier. The disc itself features 241 tokens made up of 45 distinct signs, and many have attempted to decipher the code on the disc, but it's pretty much agreed upon that there isn't enough context to decipher it properly. And apparently, there's even a small group of archaeologists who think the disc could be a hoax or a forgery. But it's pretty cool to look at. You can look at it, gawk at it for a second. I'm not going to shame you. Ever-burning lamps. These are lamps that burn without necessary oil. There's stories of these lamps that come from all around the world. Uh, these ancient ever-burning lamps are usually found in tombs or enclosed places, even though these places have been sealed for hundreds of years. Examples include the tomb of Pallas, a tale from the reign of Emperor Justin of a lamp lit 550 years ago that was still burning. And by far the most perplexing example of all of these ever-burning lamps comes from Jechul the rabbi, and these were documents from the 13th century that state there was a lamp outside of this guy's house that burned continually without any apparent supply of oil. And every time someone questioned him about it and asked him about it, he always refused to discuss the mechanics of the lamp. So I guess it was a touchy subject for him, I guess. Indus script, also known as the Harappan script, it's a corpus of symbols produced by the Indus Valley Civilization that date back to 2600 through 1900 BCE. Most of the inscriptions that contain these symbols are extremely short and they read right from left, 
but the language has yet to be fully deciphered. But the efforts are still ongoing, so maybe soon they'll connect the dots and we'll have a new language. Rome's secret name. I found this one very interesting while I was researching it, but there are many fascinating theories regarding this topic. Some people assume the secret name comes from the Pelasagans. It is said that the people named it a word meaning strength and value, and some people say its origins are from the Enides verse concerning the river Tibur. Some even argue it is an evolution of the terms Ruma, Rumia, and Rumina, the ancient translation of Utter concerning the famous wolf fed Romolo and Remo. But there is a very old source that suggests the sacred name of the city was Amor, though the names Serenia and Herpa have also been put forward as candidates for the secret name. And although there is a Latin goddess of silence called Agerona, who was the protecting goddess of Rome and the keeper of the sacred name of the city, which might not be pronounced lest it should be revealed to her enemies, it was even thought that Agerona itself was the secret name. Anyway, anyone who revealed the name, Romans tended to execute, and the Romans never mentioned it except in veiled terms, so it pretty much is still a mystery, and it was kind of perplexing, kind of hard to wrap my head around this topic. The death of Romulus. You can find several theories on the death of Rome's founder and first king from ancient sources. He was said to have died at the age of 55 after a 37-year reign on July 7th. The authors all agree he didn't die of natural causes, though, but they all disagree on the actual events that took place. And here are the possibilities. One, he ascended to heaven. Yes, the poet Ovid wrote that he did not die of natural death because he was brought to heaven by his divine father Mars, where he became a god named Corinus, and his wife also ascended with him, I believe. And the second one, a coup d'etat of the partitions is another theory because they had a reason to hate Romulus because he potentially put the Romans' lives in danger through his decisions and behavior. Now, one of those sounds more real than the other, but I'll leave it up for you to decide. Where is Cleopatra's tomb? Another tomb mystery. This is our third one on this video. But Cleopatra, just in case you don't know, she was the last queen of Egypt, and her tomb has been lost for more than 2,000 years, causing massive intrigue and mystery, just like in the case of Jesus' tomb and Alexander the Great's tomb. But unfortunately, the chance of finding her tomb are very slim. But as for how she died, it's said that she killed herself by getting a venomous snake called an asp to bot her. And according to ancient writers, she was initially buried with Antony in a mausoleum. But after that, it's very unknown. Missing poems from the epic cycle. We all probably know the epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, but the names of these lost epics are the, Sop the Sop Sopria, the Athiopus, the Little Iliad, the Elopris, aka the Sack of Ilum, Ilium, Nostia, aka the Return, the Telegony, and I'm not going to explain these stories because I can barely pronounce the titles, but you can look up each one of them if you're interested. It's pretty neat. Dead Sea Scrolls. These were discovered by Israeli archaeologist Yuval Peleg when he stopped his jeep outside the Dead Sea in a fairly harsh and remote area where he would soon find the most important religious text in the Western world that were found in 1947. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are made up of 800 pages made of animal skin, papyrus, and forged copper that allow us to have a deeper understanding of the Bible. In the text, there are parts of every book in the Old Testament except for the book of Esther, and also in the scrolls were previously unknown hymns, prayers, commentaries, mystical formulas, and even the earliest version of the Ten Commandments that we know of. And most of the scrolls were written between 200 BC and 70 AD, predating the previously oldest known Hebrew text of the Bible by 8 to 11 centuries. Gobekli Tepe. This is a monument in Turkey that completely reshaped our previous ideas of civilization, and it was built, get this, 6,000 years before Stonehenge. It consists of more than 20 circular stone enclosures, the largest of which was 20 meters across, and a circle of stone with two elaborately carved pillars 5.5 meters tall at its center. And the carved stone pillars were very eerie, stylized human figures with folded hands and fox pelt belts that weighed up to 10 tons. So carving and erecting these things must have been quite the tremendous challenge for people who hadn't even yet domesticated animals or invented pottery, let alone metal tools. And these structures 
are about 11,000 years old or more, making them humanity's oldest known monumental structures, built for no shelter, but for some other purpose. And this was all discovered by German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt when he was excavating on a Turkish mountaintop. Indus Valley Civilization the Indus Valley is full of mysteries including an undeciphered script and its godless lifestyle, which makes it perfect for this iceberg. It was the first Indus city to be discovered and the civilization was formed during the Bronze Age in the northwestern region of South Asia, and it lasted from 3300 BCE to 1300 BCE. But the mystery of this place is very similar to the other civilizations we discussed because most of their culture and way of life is unknown due to us not being able to decipher their Indus script, which is the key to their civilization. Without language, we're just kinda lost. Sappho's Lost Poems Quote, Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? For if she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather will she give them. If she does not love, soon she will love, even unwilling. This poetry belongs to Sappho, an ancient Greek poet from the island of Lesbos, and we actually know very little about her. Shocker. <laughs> but the lines from a moment ago are Sappho's work, Ode to Aphrodite, written around 625 through 570 BCE. And as it would be, that's the only completed poem we have of her entire works. And in total, there are more than 700 fragmented lines of her work that we know of today. So what could have happened to erase this much of her work? Well, the leading theories are... They could have been censored by the medieval church because Sappho was a lesbian, and also there could have been just poor record keeping for such an obscure dialect. The mystery of the elongated skulls. This mystery revolves around human skulls found that look like they come straight out of the movie Alien, but the reality of these long skulls are pretty intriguing. It's a practice that is generally unknown to people today, but it was part of a ritual of deforming the skull into an unnatural shapes, and this was done when a person was a newborn, because new newborns are very pliant and malleable, I guess is a good way to put it. And it was a huge part of many societies around the, around the globe for thousands of years. But the reason they did it is still a mystery to this day. I get a kick every time I say that phrase. I'm sorry, I try to keep a straight face. But the action of this was performed by putting two boards on the head, one on the front and one on the back, and then a cloth was wrapped tightly around the skull to make it push back and upwards. But the main theory on why this was performed is that it was a sign of being royalty or high social class, but some other researchers think that this was performed by some tribes to set themselves apart from other neighboring tribes. And when these skulls were first discovered, there were claims of them not even being human, because you always gotta have an alien theory in an ancient mysteries video. Now, the final entry of this video. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? So, Jewish and Christian tradition presents the Ark of the Covenant as a physical manifestation of God's presence and supreme power. Ancient Israelites marched the Ark into battle and brought whole cities to their knees. The Ark was so sacred that touching it meant instant death. And once it was laid to rest in the Temple of Jerusalem's holiest chamber, only the high priest was allowed in its presence and only once a year. And one of the most well-known theories about the Ark is linked to Ethiopia's 14th century national epic, the Kebra Nagast. According to this account, the Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon in Jerusalem during the 10th century BCE and had a son by him on her journey home. Their son, named Menelik, returned to Jerusalem once he was of age. Although Menelik ultimately chose to go back to his mother, Solomon sent him with a company of Jewish sons. But unbeknownst to Solomon or Menelik, these companions, frustrated about leaving Jerusalem, decided to take a souvenir of sorts, the Ark of the Covenant. It was too late for Solomon to retrieve the sacred vessel by then, and Menelik brought the Ark with him to the city of Axum, and, with the Ark at his side, he later conquered a number of surrounding territories for what would become the Ethiopian Empire. But most historians think that if it did exist, the more than 3,000 year old relic either disintegrated over time or was destroyed. But this too is only speculation, of course. For many, the final fate of the Ark of the Covenant remains a fascinating mystery and perhaps 
an, un an unsolvable one. And that's going to do it for the first part of the Ancient World Mysteries Osberg. Maybe you enjoyed, maybe you didn't. If you're still watching at this point, I salute you for your service because you somehow bared my voice for this long. Truly a feat, a magnificent one at that. Even more impressive than Kratos taking down Thor. It's pretty bonkers what you just did. But anyways, allow me to hop off your wiener. I just want to say thanks, and I'll catch you in the next one. Part 2 of the Ancient World Mysteries Osberg. This is actually the second time I'm recording this intro, because the first time I did it outside, it sounded like I was in the middle of a natural disaster. And this wind issue does pop up randomly at the worst times throughout this video, like a boner. But it's not bad. It's only in like 5% of the video. 95% of it is wind free. I apologize for that. I didn't have the wind screen on the microphone like a big doofus. So you can blame that solely on me. I just wanted to warn you. But with the unfortunate news out of the way, the good news is we can go ahead and hop into the Osberg, starting off on level 3 with the entry. Ancient Automatons. Not ancient Autobots, like I initially thought for some goofy reason. But just to lay the groundwork, an Automaton is a human-made machine that is practically self-operating. A good example of this would be a modern-day clock. And we actually wouldn't have all the automation we have today without ancient automatons. These old machines can be traced back all the way to ancient Greece, with even the word automatons coming from the Greeks. More specifically, the poet Homer. From all his epic poems he wrote, you can find mention of automatons like self-moving tables in Olympus, and even robots created by Hephaestus. All throughout Greek mythology, there are mentions of these automatons. But automatons were not only restricted to Greek myth, because they built self-directed machines that they used in the real world. For example, we found evidence suggesting that they had automatons of an eagle and a dolphin on display at their Olympic Games. And many of their automated creations were only toys until an inventor known as Philon of Bosentinium created a repeating crossbow sometime between 280 and 220 BC. And during the Hellenistic period is where automation really seen huge advancements took major leaps and bounds forward because inventors began using complex systems of levers, pulleys, and wheels to build these self-operating machinery. There was even a book written on it called On Automaton Making, written by one simply known as the Hero of Alexandria. And this book, what was inside it, it had some pretty insane things like hydraulic systems, wind-operated machines, and even self-propelled carts. There were many more examples of ancient automatons other than what I've discussed here, like Roman robots, for example. Those are a pretty crazy one. But all of this automation came to an end in the ancient world alongside the collapse of the Roman Empire because much of the knowledge on the subject was lost due to it being destroyed or just simply lost due to poor rec record keeping. But that doesn't mean every bit of it was destroyed because much of it did survive and it was later used by the Byzantines and the Arabs to build machines based on Greek and Roman models. And if it weren't for these ancient automation advancements, we wouldn't be surrounded by the amazing technology and automation we see every day. And now our next entry that I also have to redo because of the vicious wind outside is the Gundestrup Cauldron. This cauldron was a huge discovery that gave us more understanding of the Celtic mythos as well as their culture. But to start at the beginning to back it all up to where it began, this was discovered in 1891 in, you, you can read that word, you can also read that word, near Gundistrup in Denmark. The age of the cauldron is really hard to tell exactly, but it's estimated to be from 150 to 1 BCE. So a daggone long time ago. And they think this cauldron was forged somewhere in the Balkans with that word metalwork. And it consists of 12 inner and outer panels, a bowl base with metal rims. And upon analysis, the cauldron, they discovered it was 97% silver and 3% gold. But the biggest part of it is that it had engravings on this metal of Celtic iconography like the Celtic god Serenos, a bull hunting scene, and warriors being reborn. And after everything they eventually learned about this cauldron, after its discovery, they think that its purpose was intended for religious or ceremonial use. However, the case for all these entries, you're going to soon find out, we'll never know 100% for sure 
what it was actually created for, and who even created it. But I think something's more fun when it's shrouded in mystery. I think Scooby and the gang would agree with me on that one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and teleport back outside, back to the original footage for the rest of this video. There are gonna be some wind spots here and there, but if you can bear listening to my voice, you can stand a little bit of wind. The long man of Wilmington. <laughs> I'm using every fiber of my being not to make a really bad immature penis joke right now, even though that kind of just indirectly did make one, but whatever. The Long Man of Wilmington, also known as the Wilmington Giant, is a human-shaped hill figure on the steep slopes of Wendover Hill near... near... <laughs> near... I can't speak right now, man. I think it's, it's too cold to speak out here. My teeth are chattering, and that's why I'm messing up words. I'm going... It's on Wendover Hill near Wilmington, East Sussex, England. This figure was made to look proportionate when viewed from below, and was formerly thought to originate from the Iron Age or maybe the Neolithic period, but in 2003, archaeologist investigations showed the figure may have been made in the early modern era during the 16th or 17th century AD. It looks like it was made by some kids drawing on the sidewalk with chalk, or maybe someone like took their kids drawing off the fridge and made it into a, a grass shaving. <laughs> it kind of looks a bit goofy, to be honest. But it was actually made with white chalk breeze blocks and lime mortar. Its origins remain unclear also, but there's a well-known story that says the long man had been cut by monks from a nearby Wilmington priority and was supposed to represent a pilgrim, but this isn't believed by most scholars because they think the monks wouldn't have drawn an unclothed figure. But the earliest record of this figure was from 1766 when William Burrell drew it when visiting Wilmington Priory, but his drawing shows the figure holding a rake and a scythe both of which are shorter than what we currently see on the present staves. Darius the Mede is a man mentioned in the Bible in the Book of Daniel more specifically, and he was said to be the king of Babylon who reigned between Belzar and Cyrus the Great. But the thing is, he isn't known to history whatsoever. Not a single strand of his pubic hair can be found, which leads scholars and researchers to believe that he was a work of literary fiction. But through their best efforts, they've tried to sync up the Book of Daniel with actual history and identify him with a few figures like Cyrus, Syaxerus, and Gobirus. I didn't say any of those right, I'm sure. And that's about all we know, really. He's like a locked character in a video game. You can only tell very little about him unless we come to find out much more. Rongorongo. That's not a Japanese word. I don't know why I said it like that. Rongorongo. For, for this, we have to travel back to Easter Island like we did in part one for the Moi statues. But this is a mystery that is connected to the Maui statues. Mio, Maui, I don't know how you say it. But the Rongorongo is a set of etched symbols that were discovered during the 19th century on 26 different wood tablets. And these tablets, while discovered in 1864, have no known origin date. They just estimate they were made sometime in the 13th century, but the intricate designs of the Rongorongo appear to be glyphs or a writing system of sorts. And some even believe that decoding these symbols could give us insight to the collapse of the ancient Easter Island civilization, but until then, all we have is these neat, meaningless symbols to stare at. Very nice. The Black Sea Flood. The Black Sea is a black lake that used to be part of the Mediterranean Sea, but it was cut off by a high piece of land that dammed the entry of seawater through a narrow place called the Bosphorus Valley. But this Black Sea Flood allegedly took place about 9,400 years ago when the Mediterranean waters rose above the dam, which reconnected the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea, and they flowed over top of the Bo Bosphorus Sill with the force of 200 Niagara Falls. And a pretty divisive theory from 1977 at Columbia University says that this flood could have wiped out early human set settlements around the lake's perimeter and could have been the inspiration for stories like Noah's Ark, the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh as well, and all the other flood myths that we talked about in part one. But a new study suggests that the flood, if it even happened, was much smaller and not near biblical proportions. They think it raised only five to 10 meters around that time, not 50 to 60 meters like previously suggested. So the water would have drowned an area similar in size to half of Rhode Island instead of, instead of something like the size of West Virginia, which is the state I'm currently in, like previously thought. So it's hard to say 
whether this flood was as big as initially thought, smaller than initially thought, or if it simply never happened at all. Vinca symbols, discovered in 1875 and sometimes known as the Danube script, are a set of untranslated symbols, we'll come to see a lot of those, found on Neolithic era artifacts from Vinca culture and also somewhat related to old European cultures of Central and Southeastern Europe. And the main debate over the script is if it's the earliest known human writing system or if it's just a bunch of symbols, as it's referred to as pre-rotting or photo-rotting. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> Ancient Greek Zombies. I hate to be the post-Christmas Grinch and spoil the fun so soon, but this isn't like the Walking Dead Zombies or Marvel Zombies. It's in reference to two ancient Grecian graves discovered that contain skeletons inside who have been pinned down with heavy objects like rocks. Almost as if they didn't want the dead coming back from the grave. And archaeologists have been trying to solve this mystery since the 80s, but a new study suggests that the people in the grave were called revenants, or what's known as revenants, which the ancient Greeks believed were capable of leaving the grave and harming the living. So, ancient zombies, pretty much. So the reason the ancient Greeks performed these types of burials was out of superstition, it seems, is the most likely case. And even one of these graves had a child's bones in it, so so this is some pretty wild stuff right here. But I guess it worked because they didn't come back from the grave, did they? <laughs> Hermes, that word, you can read it for yourself, is a legendary figure from the Hellenistic period that was a result of a syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. And the syncretic combination, I can't really pronounce that first word, but it's basically just a fusion dance between the two different beliefs or schools of thought. So you just force them together and treat them as one god, practically. So they just kind of like touch tips, and now they're one god. But anyways, Hermes' unintelligible last name was the supposed author of the Hermectica, which was a wildly diverse set of ancient and medieval texts that laid the groundwork of various philosophical systems known as Hermeticism. This figure, though, was said to have the knowledge of the spiritual and the material world, the best of both worlds, you could say, which rendered the writings attributed to him of great relevance to anyone interested in interrelationship between the material and the divine. This figure can also be found in both Islamic and Baha'i writings. Mithras and Mithraism. So, Mithraism was an underground Roman religious group that worshipped a pagan deity called Mithras. All Mithraea featured a, I don't know how to say that word, which is an image of the god Mithras slaying a sacred bull. And ruins of Mithras temples have been found all over the place really, but this wasn't a small religion by any means also. Some historians say that it was so widespread at a point that it was considered a rival sister religion to Christianity. But overall, not much is known about the religion itself, and it's left people scratching their noggins for nearly 2,000 years, because mem members of this cult-like religion appear to have not left behind any reputable written accounts of their inner workings of this religion. And if they did, it's all been lost to time. So that's left historians and scholars to do everything they can to solve this seemingly unsolvable mystery. I don't think even Batman and Sherlock Holmes, if they did a fusion dance, could crack this one. Maybe Scooby and the gang, though, they could probably get it done. But while there's no stone-cold facts to use, they do have some clues from the discovered temples to go off of, and that's what they're using to crack this case. But a man named David Yelasny thinks he may have solved this puzzle. His theory says the cult's central iconography is the star map. The bull that Mithras kills is actually the zodiac Taurus, and by slaying it, the god is responsible for shifti shifting the procession of the equinoxes. And that is supposedly the secret cosmic movement that was shared among indoctrinated members of the ancient cult during the time when the universe was still seen as a never-moving entity. But that theory can't be proven or really disproven due to the aforementioned lack of knowledge of the inner workings of this cult-top religion. And on top of that, they aren't even sure where the god Mithras himself even comes from or is based on. Plutonian at Hierapolis. So to start, I need to explain what a Plutonian is. It's basically a sanctuary that's specially dedicated to the ancient Greek god Pluton, 
And these stru structures were built in areas thought to produce poisonous emissions and were considered to represent an entrance straight to the underworld. And this entry specifically refers to one of these structures at a place called Hierapolis. And this city became well known throughout the entire Roman world for another reason besides being a major spa town. It's a much more sinister reason because it was said to be the location of a gate to hell. And a shrine called a Plutonian was built on this site. This site became a very popular place for pilgrims to travel and to sacrifice things, offering them up to the god Pluto. And writers from the time describe these occurrences as chilling spectacles because a priest would lead an animal into the shrine, and as if by the hand of God, they would drop dead instantly. Now, I know you may be thinking, how did the animal die and not the priest, or you may just be saying that this isn't true whatsoever, but I'll touch on all that just in a second. So through research, they were able to discover what made this wild spectacle happen. It's because there are toxic levels of carbon dioxide in the air around the shrine location, so to put that in perspective, normal levels are 0.4% CO2, and this area had a staggering 80% CO2 level in the air. And to put that in perspective, a few minutes of exposure to 10% CO2 will kill you. And these high levels are due to the shrine being built on a Pamukkale fault, not actually being a portal to hell by the way, but the Pamuke fault, or however you say that word, is a 35 kilometer long active fault zone that allows these deadly gases to escape. So it's like a butt crack for the earth, pretty much, after a really bad Taco Tuesday. And as for the animals dying and not the priest, it's believed it's because the animals were much lower to the ground, and since CO2 is heavier than air, it rests very much lower, and is far deadlier to things that are lower to the ground as opposed to higher up. The Antikythera Mechanics. This piece of ancient history was discovered in 1900 when a diver went diving in the East Mediterranean around the island of Simi. After he went down and poked his nose into a couple things, he resurfaced and began rambling about a heap of dead naked people, which just so happened to turn out to be marble sculptures scattered along the sea floor along with many other artifacts. And one of these items found among them was a lump the size of a dictionary that initially didn't capture much interest until many months later at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens when the lump broke apart and revealed bronze precision gear wheels the size of coins. And according to archaeologists, gears like the ones they discovered shouldn't have existed at the time in ancient Greece or anywhere else in the world to be specific. But now this lump is known as the Antikythera Mechanism and it's flabbergasted historians and scientists for well over 120 years now. But since it initially broke apart, it has continued to break apart into 4, 84, 82, not 84, I can't read, 84 pieces now, resulting in possibly the hardest jigsaw puzzle to date. And today, we have a grasp on some of its functions, but much of it still remains a huge mystery. So what could this ancient mechanism from 60 to 70 BCE really be hiding from us, and what was its purpose for creation? The Lost Mine of Ophir. This is in reference to King Solomon and his immense wealth of gold he had. Uh, it was said that he got the gold from the mine Ophir and would have totaled around $60 trillion worth of gold today, well over 500 tons overall, an absolute absurd amount. But the issue is that no one can agree where Ophir is or if it even existed, because there's never a reference to a specific location. The only thing we have to go on is just general clues that could be referring to several different places. So naturally, there are several theories about the location of Solomon's mines. Archaeologists have found copper mines in Israel and Jordan, which they claim are the mines of Solomon, where he gained his wealth from. However, there's not enough conclusive evidence, which means the search is still very well well ongoing. There are other locations mentioned as well, like mines in Africa, Asia, and even the Americas, none of which can be confirmed either, obviously. And another popular theory is that the name could have been lost in translation, so they think the original name of the mine could still be in the original Hebrew text, and it's not actually Ophir, but who knows? That's None of that's concrete, and that's why it's on the Ancient World Mysteries iceberg. By the way, Please don't play a drinking game every time I say mystery, though, or you will definitely die from alcohol poisoning. Woodhinge, for when you're too poverty to afford Stonehenge. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. But it is actually referred to as the lesser-known neighbor of Stonehenge. It's a Neolithic construction in present-day present day Wiltshire that consists of six concentric circles 
of six, I don't, I just had a seizure during mid-sentence. It consists of six concentric rings of timber dating back to about 2500 BC. And it's located only two miles away from Stonehenge, hence why it's called the lesser known neighbor. But I never have heard of this until doing research on it, so I guess that, you know, the nickname's true. It's like the red-headed stepchild of Stonehenge. Nobody really cares about it. <laughs> But it is thought that this was built by the same people who initially built Stonehenge. Uh, and to be fair though, it isn't as cool as Stonehenge, which could be the reason it's less popular. And there are theories, of course, for this site. They think it was used as like a warm-up of sorts before they built Stonehenge, so they made sure they got it right. That was disproven though, because Stonehenge was built far before this was. So now it's widely believed that this is a burial site or had some ceremonial purpose in the ancient times. Anunnaki! Now we get into a slight overlap with the conspiracy theory iceberg because Anunnaki are a group of deities from the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. According to early Sumerian writings though, these gods are a pantheon of deities and are descendants of on and Ki, the god of the heavens and the goddess of earth, and their main function was to decree the fates of humanity, the oldest of the bunch of the Anunnaki being Enil, Enlil, the god of the air, and the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon, so he's like Zeus, pretty much, he's the top dog. But the Sumerians believed that it was Enlil who separated the heaven and the earth, and that before him, the two things were inseparable, they were as one. And now, this is where we get into the conspiracy theory territory, so go ahead and plop your tinfoil hat on, set on your tinfoil dildo, whatever you have to do to get into the spirit of conspiracy theories. So some believe that these gods were real, and that they come from the mysterious Planet X. <laughs> <laughs> which was said to have passed very close to Earth thousands of years ago, allowing them to, you know, hop over and come here. And they say the purpose the Anunnaki came here from Planet X was to force humans to be their slaves and mine gold for them. Because they would need gold on their planet, presumably because their economy works much the same as ours. But anyways, when they had what they needed, all the gold they could mine up, all the resources they could take off of Earth, they supposedly left and returned to Planet X. Some goofballs, though, even go as far as saying Anunnaki were reptilian humanoids who helped the Sumerians develop <laughs> their rotting systems and mathematics. And they think these reptilians are still around today, controlling the human world from the shadows like puppeteers. Reptilian puppeteers. Skelly puppeteers. So yeah, the Anunnaki are definitely an interesting glimpse into the ancient way of life and their belief systems. But it's also a good wake-up call and a reminder that people are dumb as ever today. <laughs> Hyperborea. They were a mythical people who lived in the far northern part of the known world. Despite being located in a northern and frigid area, the Hyperboreans were believed to inhabit a sunny, temperate, and divinity-blessed land. In many versions of the story, they lived north of the Riffian Mountains, which shielded them from the effects of the cold north wind. And it's said in the mythos that the only way to reach Hyperborea was the use of enormous swans. So that, those little those little swan boats that you paddle across, across the lake. Like that, but a bit bigger and you rode on their backs. However, later on, riders disagreed on the existence and location of the Hyperboreans, with some regarding them as purely mythological, and others connecting them to real-world peoples and places in northern Eurasia. Pretty much just envision a fantasy utopia, and that's practically what Hyperborea is. Sounds very sci-fi. I may even be reading off the wrong thing. I might have just like copied from some sci-fi book or game or something. I don't know. I might have just read you something off of a fandom website. <laughs> Newgrange. These are ancient tombs that somehow keep perfect time. Hello, Jasper. My doggy. Look. Doggy. Doggy, doggy. Doggy, doggy. Sorry, I had a fluffy intruder there that kind of made me break my train of thought, but Newgrange are ancient tombs that somehow keep perfect time and even act as calendars. But let's back it up real quick to the creation of these wonderful mysteries. They are located in an Irish country called Meath, north of Dublin, and were built around 3200 BC during the Neolithic era. They far predate Stonehenge and even the Pyramids of Giza, and Newgrange was built with astrological alignment as well, which means on the morning of the winter solstice, the central chamber is briefly illuminated by the rising sun's rays that come through the passage. Seems a lot of these ancient creations, though, were aligned astronomically, and when all of our knowledge tells us they shouldn't have had the capabilities of performing stuff like this with our 
their lack of technology. So the more we discover, the more we find out we don't really know anything about our ancient ancestors. And it seems like all these ancient civilizations had some dwarfs among them that could just build anything and everything they wanted. They were magical with tools and hammers. Got another fluffy intruder. Hello, fluffy intruder. Oh, you smell like poop. Oh my god. Do you have poop on you? I think he has poop on him. He smells worse than a porta potty. <laughs> Roman, that word. Read it for yourself again. There are more than 100 of these objects found in areas that have been part of the Roman Empire. And these objects are all hollow and made of bronze. They have a geometric shape with 12 flat faces and an. an, an and each face is a pentagon. That's what I was trying to say. And they're all embellished with a series of knobs that are on each corner of the pentagons. These neat little things, though, have befuddled people for quite a long time since they were first discovered 200 years ago. And today, this mystery still isn't fully untangled with researchers constantly trying to understand their origin as, and as well as their purpose. But some of the most common theories for these things include a candlestick holder, flower stands, staff decoration, Scepter decorations, fortune telling devices, children's toys, dosses, measuring devices, or a bludgeon. So they're pretty much like an all in one. You buy this, you don't need to buy anything else for the rest of your life. But the most accepted among these is that it was a measuring device and that it was used to measure ranges on the battlefield. The Bend Pyramid of Sneferu. This is one of the most unusual pyramids in the history of ancient Egypt. It was one of the first pyramids that was built as well, located at the Egyptian Royal Necropolis at Dasher. The ancient Egyptian name for this pyramid was the Southern Shining One because it was constructed with polished and shining Tura limestone. The pyramid, though, was built under Egyptian Old Kingdom Pharaoh named Sneferu around 2600 BC, and it was actually his stepson, Khufu, who oversaw the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza in the years to come. Fun little fact, but back to uh, old Sneferu. His pyramid, though, got its name, the Bent Pyramid, because it has steep changes in its slope. The walls of the lower part of the pyramid rise at like a 54 degree angle, and then right above the base, there's an abrupt flattening of the slope to 43 degrees, which is what gives it its distinct bent shape. And as for the theories, some think it was intentionally built like this when the pharaoh heard of another one of the pyramids collapsing, so he wanted to make it more structurally integral, make it stronger. And another theory says he may have just built it like this to speed up the process and complete the pyramid faster. And by far the goofiest theory, in my opinion, is that some believe he had the pyramid, pyramid bent like this for religious reasons. Because, you know, those Egyptian gods love their pyramids to be bent. But there's also some theories about hidden rooms in this pyramid because not all of it has been explored. And on top of that, Pharaoh Sneferu's remains have never been found, so who knows? We may have some secrets coming coming for us out of this pyramid. Now, we made it to the last entry of level 3, the mystery of the Pleiadians across various civilizations. So, to start, the Pleiadians are, in Greek mythology, the seven daughters of Titan, Atlas, and the Oceanid Pleon. And these children are supposed to have eventually formed a constellation in the stars, and this entry is relating to how several different cultures have very similar stories all about this same star cluster, dating all the way back to 100,000 years ago. The similar stories are all over the place in Europe, Africa, Asia, Indonesia, Native America, and Aboriginal Australia cultures. And the story is very familiar in all accounts of it. It includes things like the lost sister and moving stars, and it's thought that the tale of the seven sisters and Orion is so old, it could have been told around campfires in Africa 100,000 years ago and could potentially be the oldest story in the world. Moving down to level four now, and apparently growing a beard, we start off with Ain Dara's footprints. These are some ancient feet pics. The end. <laughs> but in all seriousness, these footprints are a pretty big deal because they are far too big to be human, and some think they are the feet print of God entering his house. And the feet prints are located in northern Syria in Ain Dara, which consists of complex buildings built around a large central temple, which is where the footprints are, by the way. And the temple is believed to be a Syro-Hittiti. 
Temple from the Iron Age. It was discovered in 1955 and was determined to be in use for about 550 years from 1300 to 740 BC. But to get back to the feet pics real quick, at the entrance of the main hall, the size of the feet suggests that the person they belong to would have been about 65 feet tall because the distance between the prints themselves is 30 feet. So the theories for this mystery are, of course, the aforementioned god leaving them to even ancient giants, giants leaving them. But unfortunately, we won't ever know the true nature of these perplexingly large feet because sadly, in 2018, it was reported that the Ain Dara temple was largely destroyed due to airstrikes by Turkish Turkish air forces. So screw you, Turkey. I'm never eating your food for Thanksgiving again. But it is unfortunate and truly sad that we'll never get to examine and truly figure out who left these cartoonishly large footprints. Dogu, which is Japanese for earth figure, are small humanoid and animal figurines made during the later part of the Jomon period, 1400 through 400 BC. The National Museum of Japanese History says there are around 15,000 of these statues, and most of them are found in Eastern Japan, with it being rare to find them in Western Japan. And the purpose of these statues is obviously unknown, or they wouldn't be on this iceberg, but the main theory is that they were effigies of people that manifested a sort of sympathetic magic, like removing an illness and putting it into the statue. Nebra Ska Disc, often referred to as the world's oldest map of the stars is a circular copper plate 12 inches in diameter about the size of a medium pizza just for reference it contains inlaid circles and crescents representing stars the moon and possibly the sun with stars dotted all around but this disc has been the topic of much debate with a number of different interpretations of what's depicted some believe it is the earliest representation of astrological phenomena dating way back to 1600 bc but other archaeologists believe that none of this is true and it's not really that old they even question if it's a map at all. They think it's more of an abstract work of art, but whatever the case, it's definitely an interesting artifact and a very important one if they ever get to the bottom of the mystery. Silphium. This is in reference to an herb from the time of Julius Caesar. I, I gotta say, he makes a daggone good salad. But according to the stories, Caesar kept a cache of it in the government treasury, and they even used it in money. It was worth its weight in gold, but now no one knows if it even still exists. But a description of the herb says that it had stout roots, stumpy leaves, and bunches of small yellow flowers, but it oozed sap that was delicious and also very useful, being said that to name its uses would be endless. And it apparently seemed like the miracle herb as well, and Theophagus, Astrus, the father of botany, said that it stumped even the most enthusiastic plant geeks of the day. As for the origins of the plant, though, the legend has it that it sprouted up after a black rain washed over the east coast of Libya over two and a half millennia ago, and ever since then it grew luxuriantly on hillsides and forest meadows, but of course, Today, we can't find a trace of this stuff, and it most likely went extinct. Stone Spheres of Costa Rica. This is referencing over 300 petrospheres, often called the Dickwis Spheres. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually Dickwis, but... And they can be located on the island Kenyo, as well as the Dickwis Delta. They are believed to have originated from a now extinct Dickwis culture. <laughs> Dude, I'm so immature. During the period of 800 and 1500 AD, these spheres also range pretty drastically in size, from just a few centimeters to two meters in diameter. And there's one, uh, the largest one right here, that were modeled off of my balls because they said they needed a reference image for massive balls. But just like every other entry, their purpose is still up for debate, with multiple theories being thrown around. Some think they were a symbol of status, while other thinks, others think they were used for religious or ceremonial purposes. Tutankhamun's Iron Dagger. In 1922, a century ago, a massive discovery was made when they discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of Kings which is the ancient necropolis of the pharaohs of Egypt. And among all the valuable items found in his tomb 
One stuck out among the rest. It was a small dagger made of iron. And the dagger is about a foot long and fitted into a gold handle, which is very decorated. But the part that stunned the archaeologist is that the dagger was made of iron. It may not seem like a big deal on the surface level, but the reason it's a big head scratcher is because Iron Age technologies were in their infancy at the time, and the Iron Age for Egypt was still centuries away, so they shouldn't have been able to make this autumn. So how exactly did the young king have a supposedly impossible autumn to make? Well, it's very unlikely that the dagger was added in later on after his death if you were wondering that but the most accepted theory is that since the blade was made up of iron cobalt and had nickel traces which just so happens to be the natural composition of meteorites that is what they think it is a dagger made of meteorites so technically the dagger could be from out of this world I'm sitting here freezing my balls off man I'm shaking you can probably hear my teeth chattering genuinely now I need to finish this up what are the Vimians? Vimians. What are the Viminans? A Vimna is a word that has several meanings that range from flying temple or palace to mythological flying machines described in mythology of Sanskrit and Hindu text. But in addition to being able to fly in Earth's atmosphere, Vim Vinum Vinans Viminus were said to also be able to act as spacecrafts and submarines by traveling in space and or underwater. The Vimanus came in many shapes and sizes and had two or more engines, as well as deadly weapons, because apparently their main purpose was to be built for Warcraft purposes. So pretty much these are ancient flying cars that are more like flying saucers than cars, but they kind of look like gumdrops of sorts. It'd be pretty cool though if these things actually did exist, we'd probably be living like the Jetsons by now. Baghdad Battery. This is referencing a set of three artifacts found together, which were a ceramic pot, a tube of copper, and an iron rod. It was discovered in modern Iraq in 1936 and is believed to date back to sometime between 150 to 650 AD. And, and here's the line you've been waiting for. Its origin and purpose remain unclear. It's hypothesized, though, that it may have functioned as a galvanic cell for electroplating or some kind of electrotherapy, but there aren't any known electroplated objects from this time period, so that doesn't really make sense. But another theory is that it functioned as a storage vessel for sacred scrolls, which does sound more likely. Joseph Smith Papery. This dude is the United States founder of the Latter-day Saint movement, aka the Mormons. And his inspiration for Mormonism came from many places, but oddly enough, it seems to draw a bit from ancient Egypt. The source materials he used included Egyptian funerary papyrus fragments known as the Joseph Smith Papyri, which is very real by the way and has survived to this day, at least mostly, but the fragment or originates from ancient Thebes and were formerly owned by Joseph Smith along with four mummies, and according to Joseph himself, the papyrus held records of Abraham and Joseph from biblical lore. But it is also worth mentioning that what he discovered wasn't completely unusual it's more so unique because of the individual who owned it rather than the artifact itself. Because Joseph claimed that these two roles were physically authored by Abraham and Joseph from the Bible themselves, even claiming hieroglyphs on them were Abraham's signature that he left to sign his artwork he did. And just to talk about the four mummies this dude Joseph owned, it turns out, according to him, they were Pharaoh Onatus, his wife, and their two daughters, one of which Joseph named Katumin. And Joseph's mother was also quite the oddball, so I guess the apple doesn't far, fall too far from the tree, because she claimed that through divine understanding, she knew that one of the mummy's daughters was the one who saved baby Moses. But divine insight once again loses to cold, hard archaeology, because archaeologists say these mummies are actually thought to be priests and aristocrats from Egypt's ruling class based on where they were discovered and the writings found with them. Also, there aren't any pharaohs or their family members that had the names Joseph and his mother claimed they did, but basically everything overall this dude did was very shady and not super reliable. Olmec Colossal Heads. The Olmecs were an ancient Mesoamerican civilization in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. 
They were also the only civilization currently to be dated all the way back to the Stone Age, and all the archaeological evidence we have points to them being a decently sophisticated but small group, and there were three major archaeological ruins attributed to them. The La Venta, Trace Zaptos, and San Lorenzo. The Olmecs were also pretty skilled at sculpting and carving, which leads us to the entry of Olmec colossal heads, because they were carved out of round boulders totaling 17 heads overall, between 5 and 12 feet tall, so they were pretty big heads. And there have also been traces of paint found on the heads, which suggest they could have been colorfully painted and they have flat backs as well, meaning they were meant to be viewed from the front. But these heads have absolutely been baffling researchers, one, because of how they were transported, because they were made from volcanic basalt about 70 kilometers away from where the heads were discovered at. The main theory historians have came up with for this is the wooden roller theory, which I reference in one in part one, by the way, and it just means that they rolled these boulders on top of wooden rollers slowly inching towards their destination. But this theory doesn't exactly account for the manpower required to move a 40-ton head, or the fact that the Olmec territory was marshland, so that doesn't seem like it would really work. So it's once again hard to tell the real story behind yet another ancient structure that shouldn't have been able to exist at the time. The Lost Labyrinth of Egypt. Below the sand of a famous pyramid site, the Pyramid of Hara, lays the thought to be mythical remains of the Lost Labyrinth, and Herodotus claims he counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid complex during the 5th century BC. These labyrinths were mentioned in ancient local text and thought to be only legends until they were rediscovered. And it's said that this labyrinth could hold the secrets to humankind and even give us details as about unknown civilizations and the rulers that lived on the planet before history as we know it began. But as of now, we haven't explored these magical labyrinths. We can only confirm their existence and that's really about it. So we'll just be patiently awaiting those secrets to everything the stories promised. Maybe there's a map to the everlasting boner pill in there or something. The Toland Man and Other Bog Bodies. There's a place called this word, bog, and inside this bog are some pretty crazy things, like bodies buried that are naturally mummified in a peak peaked bod to look like this. And among these is a corpse known as the Toland Man. He is said to have lived sometime during 405 to 380 BC and was discovered in 1950. And upon closer examination of the man, he had not suffered any injuries beside his obvious hanging, and they concluded that the part that hanging was part of the ritual sacrifice due to the time he was killed and where he was buried at. Researchers believe that the bog was seen as half earth, half water, and open to the heavens, making it easier to communicate with the gods. And this isn't the only bog body discovered in the area, which leads to the idea that this bog was a special place to those who used it for these burials. And crazily enough, it wasn't just the outside of the man's body that was very well preserved. His intestines were too, which allowed researchers to examine and determine what his last meal would have been. They said he ate about 12 to 24 hours before his execution, and his meal was likely a porridge due to the seeds and the grain found, and newer analysis says he likely ate fish and even ill in his last meal. But this discovery which was a huge deal for filling in the gaps of the Iron Age history. Mystery of the Varna Gold. This is in reference to treasure found in prehistoric graves in Bulgaria. It's the first evidence we have of ancient hierocracies, her but no one knows what has caused these civilizations to decline. Uh, I swear the cold's getting to me, man. I can't think. I can't speak. The gold itself, though, is estimated to be worth $180,000, but it's said its artistic and scientific values is beyond calculation. And according to carbon dating, this gold comes from about 6,500 years ago, meaning they were only created a few centuries after the first migrant farmers moved to Europe. And until that morning they discovered the gold, all the artifacts from the Copper Age weighed less than a pound, and what they discovered in initially in the graves was double that, so that's pretty pretty massive deal. Where the Sumerians came from? As you probably know, the Sumerians were one of humanity's first great civilizations located in Mesopotamia around 6,000 years ago, and there are mysteries upon mysteries surrounding this civilization. 
One of those being, where exactly did they originate from? And just to preface the website I gathered the information from for this entry, it has biblical amounts of information that is not only hard to wrap my head around, it's also just way too much to explain, so I'm not going to explain it thoroughly. I may even get some of it wrong, but basically they used various methods of getting DNA to try to pin down exactly who the ancient Sumerians were and where they came from. And this is a direct quote from their in conclusion statement. It says, in conclusion, our data shows that the modern Marsh Arabs of Iraq harbor mtDNAs and Y chromosomes that are predominantly of Middle Eastern origin. Therefore, certain cultural features of the area, such as water buffalo breeding and rice farming, which were most likely introduced from the Indian subcontinent, only marginally affected the gene pool of the Achandras people of the region. Moreover, a Middle Eastern ancestral origin of the modern population of the marshes of southern Iraq implies that if the marsh Arabs are descendants of the ancient Sumerians, also Sumerians were not of Indian or southern Asian ancestry. Karnak Stones The Karnak Stones are roughly 4,000 missing pieces of prehistoric stones perfectly lined up in a series of fields in Brittany. The stones date back to somewhere around 4500 BCE through 3300 BCE and stretch nearly a mile in length. As for the stone size, they range from 1 to 4 meters high, and while they have been studied and analyzed, no one has been able to come up with a solid purpose as to why they were created and placed how they were. But this is where people of the Karnak stepped in to fill in this void of knowledge with a fairy tale of their own. According to them, the stones were a Roman army that was turned to stone by Merlin, yeah, the gray pubed wizard that lived during the time of King Arthur. But there also is an alternate version to suit the Christians out there that says, the stones are an army of fleeing pagans turned to stone by Pope Cornelius of the Child Lovers. <laughs> So obviously, we don't have solid evidence to back the answers to these stones, and we probably never will, so pick your favorite of those two tales. Kofun, translated from Japanese as ancient graves, are megalithic tombs or tumuli in Northeast Asia. Kofun were mainly constructed in the Japanese archipelago between the middle of the 3rd century and to the 7th century CE. And these things have taken various shapes throughout history. The most common ones are shaped like a keyhole with one square and one circular end when viewed from above. And these things are huge, measuring several hundred meters across, and are surrounded with a moat. Probably not with alligators, unfortunately. They contain valuables, though, like bronze and iron goods, and are protected by terracotta figurines called Haniwa. They symbolize power and wealth, much like the pyramids do for ancient pharaohs. Rupkund, known to locals as Mystery Lake or Skeleton Lake, is a very high altitude glacial lake located in the Indian Himalayas. And the mystery surrounding this lake starts with a 1942 discovery by H.K. Madwell when he stumbled upon hundreds of human skeletons stockpiled around the Rupkund Lake. He of course reported it, and now we know that the place had around 300 to 800 people that unfortunately met their end there. And it was only because of the frigid conditions that the remains were preserved. Initially, the skeletons were thought to be belonging to Japanese soldiers or Tibetan traders on the Silk Road who died due to either an epidemic or exposure to the elements. Much like me, I'm being exposed to the elements right now. My toes are gone. Later though, after forensic analysis in 2004, the best theory was that the group of Indian pilgrims, both men and women, assisted by local porters from the region, were struck by a giant hell at Rupkun in a single event in the 9th century, which they concluded from the injuries on the skulls. But in 2010, the first human genome was sequenced, which allowed us to much better study our past, and soon, 38 of the Rupkun powdered bone samples were sent to 16 labs worldwide for analysis. This revived the skeleton lake mystery, but also revealed a shocking discovery. The study showed that the 38 skeletons belonged to three genetically distinct groups and were dumped at the lake during multiple events over a 1,000 year period. But th this far from solved the mystery, according to Musrif Tif Tifli, 
who was part of the 2019 investigation, they said, According to me, the mystery is not at all solved. We have more questions than answers. So if just 38 samples had this kind of impact, imagine what the other secrets to this lake and the remaining skeletons could hold. I gotta go inside though. I'm shaking and shivering. My toes are cold. I gotta go inside. I'll finish the last two, three entries inside. I'm in a much more comfortable setting now. I can feel my appendages once again, so let's knock out these last three entries. The Civitherium of Kish. A Civitherium is an extinct genus of primordial giraffids that once roamed the Indian subcontinent and all throughout Africa. However, scholars agree that it has been extinct for a very long time, roughly a million years to be exact. That's a bit older than your grandmother. And the mystery here is that there is a unique copper rain ring that was discovered in the remnants of ancient Kish in modern day Iraq, and the animal depicted on the object is uncannily similar to the aforementioned Civitherium. So how did an animal from the primordial times somehow thrip, slip through the cracks of Tom and live into the dawn of civilization? Well, to take a step back and talk about the discovered object, the rain ring isn't a special thing in and of itself. It's not a special artifact, but the animal depicted on it is what's baffling researchers because animals on these objects are typically like horses or cows or just, you know, common animals like that but not prehistoric giraffes. And due to the shocking accuracy depicted on the animal, it's not thought to be like a fantastical beast from imagination land, and it suggests the sculptor saw the animal firsthand. However, there is a debate among scholars. Some think the Civitherium was alive with the Sumerians and that is what depicted, while others think that it's a poor rendition of a fallow deer and that the Civitherium truly has been extinct for over a million years. But like it always is in the end, a debate is all it will ever be. But I do want to point out that we haven't fully explored 100% of the earth, so there could be some crazy things out there waiting for us in the Amazon or the ocean. What's actually inside of Quan Shi Huang's tomb? Quan Shi, Quan Shi Huang was the first emperor of China that died on September 10th, 210 BC. But the tomb itself is buried deep under a hill in central China, surrounded by an underground moat of poisonous mercury. And the tomb hasn't been disturbed for over two millennia. And whether modern people will ever be able to see the inside of the tomb and potentially unlock some mysteries depends on the Chinese government as well as science. A huge reason no one has attempted to loot the tomb is that we simply lack the technology to properly excavate it. But what we have seen is what's known as the Terracotta Warriors, who stand outside the tomb and protect it. There are thousands upon thousands of these life-sized, uniquely different statues made of clay, and it's roughly estimated there are 8,000 of these superly impressive statues that are pretty baffling to me. They look very cool. But one of the researchers states that they'll be digging for centuries, before they reach the central tomb. So until technology progresses to the point where we can get inside this tomb, we'll be left in the dark with only these cool warrior statues to look at, which I'm not complaining too much. They're pretty cool. Now, the final entry of this video. What was the set animal? So Egyptian mythology is full of animal-headed gods, but one that stands apart from the rest is Set also called Shaw. And Set was believed to have existed in ancient Egyptian times, and according to the Egyptian religion, Set is the god of storms, disorder, violence, destruction, and chaos, and his realm is the Red Land of Death, aka the desert. And the Set animal was called the Typhonic Beast, or a Typhonic animal, so what exactly was it though? Most Egyptologists believe the animal is just imaginary from ancient Egyptian times and it never truly existed. However, a bunch of zoologists have made several attempts to locate the mysterious animal recently. Some think it could just be a stylized jackal, hyena, fox, or aardvark. The set animal though is depicted as having squared ears that are erect, uh, a long nose with a little downward curve, and the color of the animal is shown to be black or reddish. 
One of the most accepted theories is that the set animal could have been a Saluki because a Saluki is the oldest domesticated dog breed with features matching the, matching the animal depicted on set and has even been depicted in a bunch of hieroglyphs as well, so it would make sense. Other theories, though, say it could represent a now-extinct species that we may never know about, and some also think it could represent an animal like the donkey mixed with a few other animals as well. But it's still very unclear whether this animal existed or not, and brrrr, drum roll, please, we'll probably never get a concrete answer. <laughs> it's a good way to end the video off. But yeah, that's it for the Ancient World Mystery Osberg Part 2. We've now knocked out levels 1 through 4. All we have left is levels 5 and 6, where it's going to get deeper and darker than ever thought possible. I assume. I haven't actually went through it yet. But I'm going to get right on that. <laughs> Ancient World Mysteries Osberg Part 3. I'm petting my cat down here. If it looks like I'm doing something weird, that's what I'm doing. But this is the final part of this series, so let's go ahead and hop straight into it with the first entry on Level 5, Adam's Bridge. Otherwise known as Ram Setu, I just want to let you know I'm going to mispronounce a lot of words in this video. If you can't tell, very thick country accent. Not good for pronouncing these foreign words. Just wanted to let you know. But it's otherwise known as Ram Setu. It's a sacred place for Hindus and referenced in Hindu mythology as well as in early Islamic texts. And this bridge is supposedly a traversable land bridge between Sri Lanka and the Indian subcontinent. The early Muslim texts say that the purpose for this bridge was to allow Adam to cross into India and escape the island where he fell to earth after being banned from the Garden of Eden. However, for the Hindus, the bridge is an artificial structure built by a god. And there is evidence that there was actually a land bridge across the strait between Sri Lanka and India in the recent geological past. So was this built by human hands or something a bit more than human? Who knows? Laos Plain of Jars. In Falsavon, Laos, there are thousands of these jars made of stone, believed to have once stored either human remains or raswan. I know that's a very big difference between those two things, but now, mysteriously, they lie in ruin with much of them being unknown. And my cat's leaving, he's already bored. But to dig a bit under the surface level, these stones range from 3 to 10 feet in height and can weigh up to 14 tons. To this day, their origin is of course unknown or they wouldn't be on this list, but archaeologists believe that they were originally used between 1500 and 2000 years ago. But as I mentioned a moment ago, researchers mainly think that these things served either as funeral urns or food storage. That seems to be the main two ideas. And as local Lo Laotian legend would have it, the jars were said to be created by Kun Chung, an ancient king of giants who lived in the Highlands. It's said that Chung, after fighting a long and victorious battle, created the jars in order to brew huge amounts of celebratory Lao Lao Rice Wine. Polynesia's Sweet Potatoes. This entry is about how sweet potatoes ended up growing legs and migrating to Polynesia thousands of years before any humans did. I'm joking of course, but they really don't know how these vegetables ended up being in Polynesia when they did, considering the people of the Americas and South Pacific shouldn't have been in contact at this time, leaving no way for the sweet potatoes to make their way to Polynesia during the time period. And this has sparked a decades-long debate about when the first contact of these ancient peoples were, but a new study suggests that the sweet potato beat people to the South Pacific Islands by at least 100,000 years. But this isn't concrete, and some say the sweet potatoes were already native to this area, but the debate is still waging like a never-ending war, and we'll just honestly never know. The lost city of Devraka. To start, the name Devraka means gateway to heaven, and it's at this location that, according to Hindu text, Lord Krishna, the eighth avatar of Vishnu, is believed to have resided. Krishna is said to have built Devraka by raising a vast swath of land from the seabed to form his city. And an ancient temple still exists on the site, but what was the purpose of giving this city the name Gateway to Heaven? Does it actually lead to heaven? Well, actually, <laughs> we'll never know, because nothing of this city has survived to present day, Dovraka. Dovraka. Even the location had to be different, because it was described as being surrounded by water on all sides and connected to land by port and bridges. Plus, the first city was destroyed by a massive flood, leaving pretty much no connection to modern-day Devraka, so 
Who really knows? The White Shaman Mural. At the White Shaman Rock Shelter in Texas, there are peculiar paintings on the rocks that seem to depict people going on a journey through the spirit world. This artwork was painted thousands of years ago and seems to show the way of life and belief system of the long gone hunter gatherer society of the area. And through decades of work, a researcher named Carolyn Boyd has worked to decipher the meaning of this mysterious work, and she believes she's made a system to understand the art and that it reads almost like an ancient language. Now, as for what this ancient language is trying to say, what it's trying to get across, I'm not too sure, so that's where I'm going to end the entry. The Tunnels at Baiae. Baiae is located in the southern Italian region of Campania and was a seaside resort for the wealthy inhabitants of Rome. Unfortunately, over the centuries, local volcanic activity has caused much of the ancient resort to be submerged underwater. And in 1932, the entrance to an unknown antrum, which is a chamber, was discovered by an Italian archaeologist named Amadeo Maiori. But he and his crew only penetrated the tunnel a couple of feet, so they didn't have the proper tools for the job. And it wasn't until an amateur archaeologist in the 1960s named Robert Paget, who was from Britain, came along that the Antrim was much more explored and they actually discovered something pretty interesting. So while he and his crew of volunteers were excavating, they discovered that it was a much more complex system of tunnels, and based on his findings, Paget speculated that it was the legendary Cave of the Sibyl, that was described by ancient authors. And this Sibyl, which means prophetess, is said to be a woman named Amalthea, Amalthea, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that very wrong, who lived in a cave in the Feligrian Fields. I can't pronounce these words, man. The E's and A's are getting to me. But these fields are the area around the tunnel that they discovered. And according to Paget, the features of the tunnel system suggest that it was constructed to mimic the visit to the mythical underworld of the Greeks. For instance, the underground stream of sulfurous water may have represented the river Styx, which is what the newly dead have to traverse in order to enter Hades, and Paget also speculated that a boat would have been waiting to ferry visitors across this area, and at the end of the stream was a flight of stairs that led to a hidden sanctuary, and that the sanctuary would have housed someone posing as the aforementioned Sibyl or prophetess. Herto Man. Many of you, much like myself, have probably never heard of the Herto Man, and probably can't even pronounce it much like myself, but the term refers to human remains uncovered in Ethiopia that date back to around 160,000 to 154,000 years ago. And at the time they were initially discovered in 1997 by Tim Watt, they were especially significant because it's from a period of human history we know very little about. Then in 2003, the Herto Man was considered to be some of the oldest dated Homo sapien remains. The remains themselves are also pretty intact, with most of the skull being unearthed, and the individuals were described as falling just out of the modern human in terms of anatomy, hence while they have been dubbed Homo sapien Idaltu, meaning elder in the Afar language of the region. But this idea, of course, has been heavily debated because nothing in this field can be agreed upon. It seems like they're all just having conflicting interest on purpose. But regardless of all that, these remains are very close relatives to us, if nothing else. Hanging Coffins of Chana, also known as Chana's Mysterious Sky Graveyard, are an ancient funeral custom that, as you can see, is quite the opposite of the modern six feet deep burial, and the most famous of these coffins come from the now extinct Bo people. And how the coffins are able to stay in these locations is by using beams projecting outwards from vertical mountain faces, or by being put in caves, or they just set on natural rock projections on these mountain faces. But the reason the Bo people use this very strange to us burial method is very unknown, obviously. It wouldn't be on this chart if it wasn't, because they no longer exist and we can't exactly ask them. But a possible theorized reason could be so that the dead just couldn't be disturbed. It would be harder for them to disturb them on mountain faces as opposed to like digging up their bodies. Land of Punt, also known as God's Land, was a faraway realm rich in incense, ebony, and gold. But the only issue now is that it pulled an Atlantis and nobody knows where it is, where it went, or if it even existed. Pretty much all the evidence we have of this land comes from the Egyptians who were in trade with the Punt people for thousands of years, but though we have all these stories and descriptions of Punt, 
No one ever made a map, wrote down the location, the general direction, or anything. They didn't put up signs saying, Poop this way, no flashing arrows, nothing like that. No guidance whatsoever. Almost as if they didn't want anybody to know where it was. Maybe it was their dirty little secret or something. But since the 19th century, uh, scholars have blindly guessed as to where this place could have been. Basically like closing their eyes and throwing a dart at a map. They say it's got to be somewhere around the Red Sea in places like Syria, Sinai, Southern Arabia, Eastern Sudan, Northern Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya. And those are all according to different Egyptologists. Egyptologist is a very weird word to me as well. I feel like it's just, you put ologist at the end of anything to make it sound official. And then when you realize how weird the word is, like Egyptologist, it's, it just sounds goofy. <laughs> Like, I could say I was a penisologist, right? <laughs> Specialized in penises or something? But to get back to this, none of these have been able to be successfully proven at all, the locations for the, the land of Punt. So it seems that Punt almost exists in a void or secluded in a bubble away from all the other land on Earth in a pocket dimension. Or maybe the Egyptians just created this elaborate ruse to fool us a couple centuries down the road. Pyramids of Argolis. This is referring to a structure called the Pyramid of Hellenicon that is located nine kilometers from the city of Argos near the Isinos River. A lot of hard words in this. And the pyramid itself is proof of miso- blah, 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 blah. And the pyramid itself is proof of mytholo myth mythology and suggest a relation between Argos and Egyptian civilization. And the controversy around this pyramid lies around the time it was constructed. But based on the excavations, it dates back all the way to the late 4th century. But using newer methods, its construction might overlap with the constructions of the pyramids of Egypt, but the first theory seems to be more plausible as of now. And now on to the theories of the pyramid's use, according to the Greek traveler, Pausanias, I guess that's how you say that, but he wrote in the 2nd century AD that the pyramid was a common tomb for soldiers, and others refer to this pyramid as a frictoria, which is a tower used to send smoke signals. But the most believed idea is that it served as a small observatory to control the surrounding area. Agodad, also referred to as the Hehu or the Infinites, were the celestial rulers of a cosmic age and thought to have appeared long before the Egyptian religious system we currently recognize. But the Agodad themselves were concerned with conserving the celestial world and making it flourish, and later on indirectly creating the human race. And the Agodad consisted of four couples, eight individual deities, and they relate to four main elements of water, air, light, and time and they serve to keep each other as well as the nature of the cosmos in perfect balance, as all things should be. And the names of these eight deities are Amun and Amunet, they were the caretakers of the air, Cook and Cocket were the harbingers of darkness, Nu and Nonet were responsible for the development and continued renewal of the primordial waters of the universe, Ha and Hahet, the last pair, were weighted with the responsibility of maintaining eternity, and infinity. Also, if you didn't catch on to the pattern between the names, the first name in each of these pairs represents the male deity, and then the second name represents a female deity, once again, going back to that balance that they love so much in the mythology. But since the time of the ancient Egyptians of the Old Kingdom, this pantheon has died out and been replaced by the Egyptian gods we're more familiar with, and it's believed the Agodad's undoing was because of their own lack to keep themselves balanced. All things come around in the end. It's ironic. What are ley lines? This is a term you've probably heard used more than a gas station toilet if you've watched any conspiracy theory videos because it's a term that they throw around to make their theories seem more plausible with big fancy words. But in short, these are lines that connect the universe through monuments and landforms. They were first theorized in 1921 by Alfred Watkins when he noticed that ancient sites all over the world sort of just fell into alignment with each other. And naturally, this idea is heavily contested, with many calling it just a bunch of hoopla, and the connections are merely just a coincidence, which is personally what I believe, but who, what do you care what I believe? And people have created their own ley lines even, drawing lines proving that anything connect can connect, like pizza restaurants, to movie theaters, etc, etc. Basically saying that the connection isn't special, you can connect things, doesn't matter what they are. Who were the Guanches? 
Archaeologists have been wondering for a long time where this indigenous tribe of the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean originated from. The theories range from them being Celtic, Viking, or even Atlantean, and according to a 2019 DNA study from ancient mummies, they are thought to be most likely Berbers from North Africa who arrived in the Canaries around 100 AD, maybe even far before that, but that doesn't solve the mystery because many questions still remain unanswered, and I don't really have the time to go into all of them, so research this yourself if it interests you. Sajama Lines. These are an ancient network of prehistoric linear paths that are located in the highlands of western Bolivia near the Nevado Sajama Volcano. These lines cover an area of 22,525 square kilometers, and not surprisingly, very little is known about them. I feel like I shouldn't have to keep saying that for every entry, but I'm going to. Anyways, they don't know who made these lines, and some suggest that the time period they were made in could be as early as 1000 BC, and they think it might have even actually took generations to be completed. But as for how they were constructed, it's believed that the method involved scraping aside dark oxidized rock and soil on the surface to reveal a lighter subsurface layer. And the lawns themselves, they pass through some pretty tough terrain, so it's impressive for whoever did this. I give them a good noodle star for effort. And the theory for their purpose is that the lawns were used by the indigenous people to navigate their routes on their journeys to sacred sites. And also that they connected with the villages around the landscape, basically like an ancient road system of sorts. And also the lines were connected with shrines that were constructed at points where the lines intersected. That's also a weird little tidbit of information. So a lot of stuff is going on here with just some simple yet not really simple lines on the ground. Iron Pillar of Delhi. At just a glance, this appears to be, well, nothing more than an ordinary iron pillar, but if that were the case, it wouldn't be on this Ancient World Mysteries iceberg now, would it? So what is the deal with this pillar? Calm down, I'm gonna get to that, but first, Pillar Lore. This pillar stands in a completely empty square in Kutbi Complex in India, and it's 7.3 meters or about 20 feet. 24 feet tall for you Americans out there, but upon closer look, this pillar is made of iron, and considering it's 1,600 years old and has been exposed to harsh elements, it should have turned to a rust pile long ago. So that's the mystery. But unfortunately, it doesn't involve alien metal workers making this out of adamantium or something crazy like that from a foreign planet. It basically boils down to ancient Indian ironsmiths being really good at what they do. So who is the mastermind that built this thing? Well, its origin story is actually engraved on the pillar in an ancient Brahmi script and is called Gupta Brahmi. And according to what is written on the pillar, it was erected, uh huh, by King Chandra and celebrates his victories in battle and was dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. And the pillar is sadly incomplete. It's supposed to have a zoomorphic or anthropomorphic image of Garuda, the eagle mount of Vishnu, but it was probably removed during the Sultanate period because the use of images went against the tenets of Islam. Now, as for why the pillar didn't rust, it's apparently due to a process known as forge welding, and the iron isn't completely pure. It includes small portions of slag, which is a byproduct of smelting. So they mix that together like a little concoction like Professor Utonium, and since the phosphorus in the ore was never removed, it created a passive protective film that is corrosion retardant. This is the only time I've found a pillar interesting whatsoever, so good job. Caracas Candelabra is a massive geoglyph in Peru that measures over 600 feet from taint to tip from tip to tip that could represent anything from a god's trident to a hallucinogenic plant. And thanks to the carbon dating of the artifacts found near this ancient geoglyph, it has helped to date the work back to about 200 BCE. However, here comes the part that gives me deja vu every single time. We have no idea about its origins, no clue what the symbol is or who even created it. But of course, there are a few theories. And these theories state what the thing could potentially be, and they range from the aforementioned trident of the creator god named Viracocha, or a hallucinogenic plant, like I said. And the area also is said to have held a ritual significance. But on top of that, others believe it was simply a sign meant for sailors looking for the Paracas coast, like an ancient lighthouse. The Great Serpent Mound. 
This is the largest snake geoglyph in the world located in the eastern United States, more specifically along the Ohio River, and it's one of the most extraordinary and mysterious man-made formations ever. The mound itself is never more than 3 feet high, but it runs for about 1,350 feet throughout the landscape, making it the largest serpent, eff serpent effigy in the world. But of course, it is shrouded in so much mystery we know nothing about its creation or its purpose. So naturally, archaeologists have heated nerd debates on what this thing's origins could be, and there are two main theories that I was able to find. The first theory is that it could belong to the Adena culture, which dates back from 800 BCE to 100 AD. And the second theory is that the Fort Ancient culture is responsible for it, and they existed from 1000 to 1750 BC, or AD, not BC. So obviously these two competing theories are a millennium apart in terms of its construction date, making it much more confusing. So I don't, I, I don't even know my butthole from a hole in the ground at this point, I'm so confused. And the fact that no ancient artifacts have been found that are associated with the snake makes this whole situation wrap up into something more confusing than a homeless man on house arrest. The Screaming Mummy, also called the Screaming Man, but just to hit you with the cold water real quick, straight out of the gate, tell you the Tooth Fairy ain't real slappy in the nuts, the mummy doesn't actually scream. I know, I was disappointed as well. I was crushed by this information, so I just had to ruin your day real quick too. But to explain this seriously, the body was found in an unmarked cedar wood coffin, which was strange for ancient Egyptian times because without your name, you couldn't go to the afterlife. But also, the body has been intentionally preserved, meaning that this person had to have been respected to some degree, because not everybody was getting this special treatment. And the first theory to spring up was that this person was of royalty and also suffered a violent death. The next theory that seems more widely believed is that she had a fatal heart attack, but beyond these two theories, it seems believed that the mummy was a female princess and likely the daughter of King Ramses, the third. What happened to the Anasazi? The Anasazi were a civilization that popped up as early as 1500 BC and their descendants are today's Pueblo Indians. And in the 10th century and 11th century, the Chacho Canyon in western New Mexico was the cultural center of the Anasazi. They built magnificent villages and one of their complexes was around five stories tall and had 800 rooms, which is crazy to think about for the time. That's like a, that's like a resort hotel. On top of this though, they also laid about 400 miles of roads across the deserts and canyons. Then towards the end of the 13th century, some cataclysmic event forced the Anasazi to flee and they're, I gotta sneeze, I gotta sneeze. Oh. Okay, I didn't actually have to sneeze, my eyes are gonna water though. Anyways, we were at the part where in the 13th century, a cataclysmic event forced the Anasazi to flee and the inhabitants moved south and east towards Rio Grande and Little Colorado River. And what this event was that caused them to make this drastic move is completely unknown. Today's Pueblo Indians, though, they have oral histories about their people's migration, but the details remain a closely guarded secret. It's like the Declaration of Independence. They won't let anybody steal it. But pretty recently, archaeologists have uncovered some good insight into why they left. It includes violence and warfare, even cannibalism among the Anasazi themselves. They describe what happened as being similar to the wheels coming off of a car, just everything came crumbling down. And on top of that, the theory there is possibly that the Anasazi may have nearly deforested the region while at the same time a drought was plaguing them. And the final theory is that Nordic raiders may have driven them from their homes because those Vikings love themselves some good raiding and pillaging. So. Who really knows? It could have been a combination of the three. I'm not too sure. Maybe they got forced out of their homes by the Fortnite zone or something. Now, the last entry of level five is, this is how Google Translate tells me to say this, Kybri. Gotta start from the beginning though. The Greek pantheon of gods has a lot of members, as you're well aware. Many of the gods are well known like Zeus or Hades, but there were also cults of secret gods as well, and that is what we call the Kybri, or Cabri. They were a group of strange thonic deities, which means people who dwell beneath the earth, and they were worshipped in a mysterious cult and were closely associated with Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the gods. But it seems to draw from pre-Greek or non-Greek elements from around the Mediterranean or even further away. Elements of older cultures were also fused in this mystery cult like Thorissians, Tyrrhenians, 
Peliskians, Pragians, and the Hittites were fused together in this cult. I'll pronounce none of those words right, I'm sure. But at the heart of the Kaibri were a group of gods who were worshipped by the initiated, and the identities of these gods are not at all easy to find out, and the cult's mysteries is limited by the secrecy of this cult. They didn't let any information come out. But the gods we do know about are the twin gods known as Daimones. And these two oversaw the dances of Samothrace in honor of the virility goddess Demeter, her daughter Perseverone, and the divine witch Hecate. And this pair were well-known metal workers, the dwarvish sons of the god Hephaestus. That's a lot of information to take in. Hope you're following along. Hope you didn't doze off during this bit. However, the identities of the other gods in this thing, because there were other gods in this thing, were worshipped in very much huge secrecy. And just like every other topic, pretty much, there's a lot more information you can dive into if you're interested, so go look it up. The lore is deep on pretty much every one of the, these entries. I'm just trying to sum it up and give it to you short and sweet. Now we're growing a big old beard and stuff, going down to level 6, the final level of this iceberg chart. The first entry is Adam's calendar. And this may just be the oldest man-made structure which is still in existence. That was funnily enough discovered in 2003 by complete accident when Jonah Heine crashed his plane into a mountainside and it was in an extremely remote location so the odds of this is very low. So if he wouldn't have crashed there, this probably would have never been discovered. But as for what he discovered, it was a truly ancient stone calendar, with the dates going back to as far as 300,000 years ago on these stones. Which, just in case you don't know, that is way before any evidence of human civilization that we know of. So this could actually re-rot human history as we know it, unironically. But of course, some people's initial, re initial reaction to this discovery is, Aliens did it! Aliens built it! Aliens did it! But to explain this in non-history channel terms, I don't think aliens actually did it, but this thing consists of an outer stone circle around 98 feet or 30 meters in diameter for those people who don't use the American system. That is the better system, by the way. And inside this big circle are several monoliths arranged in a complex pattern, appearing to have been built with astrological alignment as well. A lot of these ancient things did that for some reason. Somehow they knew how to do that, which is what made the site a calendar. But at the center of this site are two upright stones that have carvings on them, and all the material used to build this site seems to have been transported from a distance away, much like all the other ancient structures that I've talked about, like the pyramids and all that kind of stuff. They drug these stones from absurd, absurd distances away somehow. But the way everything is set up, the design only becomes apparent from an aerial view, and it's not meant to be viewed on the ground. So this gives people who thinks this thing was built by aliens more fuel to their fire because how are humans going to get back up there in that time? How are they going to see it from the air? Only aliens can because they're UFOs. With all the information implanted in your head now about this, this calendar is still fully functional to this day and allows people to keep track of the time of day as well as the year by following the shadow of the setting sun on this stone calendar. But of course, there still are some secrets that need to be uncovered regarding this thing, so until then, we can't come to any concrete solutions as to who built it. I feel so much like a broken record saying that phrase over and over, and I'm gonna have to keep saying it more. Bygone pipes are mysterious 150,000 year old iron pops that come from a time when humans were barely learning how to build fires. These pops are located in China's Qinghai province near Mount Baigong, and the pops are located in caves in that area, with the pops themselves leading to a nearby saltwater lake. And archaeologists believe that the pops were used to supply water to the nearby pyramid, since so many of the pops have been found on the shore nearby Lake Tonson. But the real head-scratcher, of course, is the age of these pops, far predating human settlement in that area, as well as being far more advanced than the human technology of that time. Which, you guessed it, lead some to theorize that this used to be the location of an ancient extraterrestrial settlement. And apparently, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences aren't ruling the possibility out, with a researcher saying, quote, it's worth looking into, and science would have determined, would have to determine if there's any truth. But another more human theory says that it may suggest an ancient forgot about civilization who used ancient forgot about techniques that have been forgotten over time. And upon testing these pops to determine what they were made of, they found that they consist of 92% common materials and metals, 
and 8% unknown materials. But a more recent theory from researchers says that these aren't metal pops at all, really, and that they are fossilized tree root casts, which is the result of tree roots undergoing pedogenesis, which is the process that forms soil, and diagenesis, which is the transformation of soil into rock. And further experiments seem to support this by them finding organic plant material in them, and also microscopic tree rings, so it seems most likely that the best explanation is that the Earth is just capable of some pretty crazy things that we're still finding out about. Human-made ditches in the Amazon rainforest. It's exactly what I just said. There are what appear to be human-made ditches in the Amazon where humans were thought to have never been in the rainforest, but... This does go a bit deeper than that, or else why would it be on the final tier? These aren't just your simple ditches beside a road, they are circular earthworks in the western part of the Amazon, and is actually one of the most important yet unexpected archaeological discoveries of modern times. But these strange geoglyphs range from 100 meters to 300 meters in diameter, with their width being 11 meters, and their depth being around 4 meters. And there's an astonishing total of 450 of these geoglyph sites that have been mapped in an area about 13,000 meters squared, with more being reported all the time. So what exactly were they? Why were they created? Well, through their investigations over the past 15 years, we've understood some, but a lot of questions still remain, obviously. But what we do know is that the time they were constructed was between 1,000 and 2,000 years ago, and they've ruled out the possibility of these things being ancient villages, so it seems more plausible that these perfectly geometric things were used sporadically for ceremonial purposes and left as an offering of sorts. So that's the what and sort of the why, so what's the who? Who built these things? We have no clue. And they haven't actually been able to find any evidence of associated local settlement populations, so the knowledge they can use to build a story behind these things is very limited. And here it comes once again. Get ready for it. Go ahead and plug your ears. You're not going to want to hear it again. It'll likely remain a mystery for a lot longer time to come. Rojum El Hiri. This is a wide series of piled stone rings located in the Golan Heights region that no one has been able to definitively date or decode since they were discovered. Golan Heights is in Israel, by the way, forgot to mention that, but that doesn't mean that there aren't theories about this thing being slung around since they can't definitively date them or decode them or whatever. First, though, let me explain a bit more about this site. What it is, is it consists of five circles of piled up bas basalt rocks that surround a central cairn that was once a tomb, but there are other smaller stone lines connecting the rings in places that create a seemingly more meaningful design. But as for the tomb at the middle, that's the reason they can't date this thing. Not like take it out for dinner or whatever, <laughs> that's a terrible joke. It's the reason they can't date this thing back to when it was created, because grave robbers have went through and had their way with this thing, picking it bone dry, not leaving one little scrap of organic material. So without any organic data, they can't sample anything, leaving no estimation to be made. But they can give rough estimations using some other scientific means that I don't know what they do, uh, and they likely say that it was created sometime around 3000 BCE near to the Stonehenge era. But now it's time for those goofy theories, baby! The first says this site was related to a death ritual of some kind, possibly where the dead would be devoured by birds, but others say that this place was some kind of ancient church to the megalithic gods. But the most prevalent theory is that the rings were used as a celestial calendar that could measure the equinoxes and assist in primitive astronomy. So now's the line I'm going to repeat in my sleep because no one knows the real origin or reason for its mysterious creation. Structure under the Sea of Galilee. A giant stone structure was discovered beneath the waters of the Sea of Galilee in Israel, and it has archaeologists scratching their noggins just like every other godforsaken entry on this iceberg. But I digress. This mystery-filled structure is cone-shaped and made of unhewn basalt cobbles and boulders, quote, and weighs an estimated 60,000 tons. So I'd barely be able to lift that, just to put the weight in perspective. You know, it's roughly the same weight as a modern-day warship, so I could barely pick it up, but like, 
just barely. It, it's a lot of weight, but not a, not too much for me. But the structure also rises about 32 feet or 10 meters, uh, like up off the ground, and it has a diameter of 230 feet or 70 meters which is roughly double the diameter of the outer ring of Stonehenge, to put it in perspective again. And structures similar to this are known to be in other parts of the world and are sometimes used to mark burials, but researchers, of course, aren't sure if that's the same reason or the same purpose this thing had. But what they do know is that the structure dates back to more than 4,000 years ago and is man-made. So that's something. That's more answers than most. But that's pretty much about it, aside from rumored plans to return and excavate the site, so we'll have to wait until then to come to any more conclusions. Hoffet at Carthage. Ancient Carthage was a city in modern Tunisia on the north coast of Africa more than two millennia ago. It reached the peak of its civilization in the 4th century BC and was one of the largest metropolises in the world at the time, being a major rival to Rome, which ultimately led to their destruction at the hands of Rome in 146 BC. And this resulted in much of their culture being lost and absorbed into Roman culture, one of those things being the Tophet. It was lost, and a Tophet, what it was, was a sacred site used for sacrifices to appease a god. And the one located outside of Carthage, they discovered young children were buried there, and it recently had been a subject of some controversy because ancient texts and evidence found by archaeologists suggest that the bodies found at the Tophet of Carthage were those of child sacrifice. So, the big question is, were the Carthagians killing their children to appease their gods? Maybe. But many are unsatisfied with this conclusion, much like your mother is after uh, I get done with her. I just roasted myself. But the, the reason they're unsatisfied is that they point out that the archaeological evidence is too sparse to make such conclusions. And some historians even claim the evidence is inconclusive because the text could have been written with ulterior motives, such as Rome's antagonistic feelings to Carthage throughout the wars. So this could have been like a fake thing wrote by Rome to make Carthage look bad. Like, oh, they're doing child sacrifices over here. <laughs> it's so petty. <laughs> But anyways, this idea is supported by surviving records from Rome that show they're very much anti-Carthage bias. However, the evidence on both sides of this argument can't be seen as complete fact. Of course, it's hard to say whether these people were killing their kids for the sake of a fictional deity or not. Why did the Cucatinia Tripilia? Cucatini Trapilia culture burned down their houses. Many of the cultures who echo throughout time are remembered for one main reason. They left behind ruins. And this group of ancient Europeans we're discussing here didn't do that. And actually, it seems like they were actively destroying all the evidence they could to be untraceable, like an arsonist trying to cover up his tracks, because that's what they did. They burned stuff down. They burned their stuff down. But the Cucatini Trapillion people would be, they would build these sophisticated buildings only to burn them down. They seem to have like an arson addiction, because for a millennia from 5400 BC to 2700 BC, this Neolithic era would build and organize large cities in what is now present day Moldova and Romania, only to burn them down intentionally 60 to 80 years later only to relocate and rebuild elsewhere and repeat the same cycle. So why did they do this? Was it a religious practice or was it a problem they were constantly faced with, like termites who can only get rid of with burning down a whole city? Well, this is where the theories come in. And considering these people were thought to be very advanced for the time period, some think the burnings were accidental due to the homes being very close proximity to textiles, grains, and other highly combustible materials. But obviously, due to them doing this repeatedly, that theory isn't very widely believed. They don't think it was accidental burnings. The next theory is that they did it for weatherproofing, and that was the reason for the burning of the houses. It was proposed that the houses were burned in order to strengthen the wall structures and properly insulate the floors against mold and dampness, which is kind of weird that, that, this, that that's a theory. Uh, but anyways, another theory says the burnings were due to constant enemy raider attacks, so they just had perpetual enemies haunting them, chasing them, constantly burning and destroying their houses and their homes and their cities, which is very messed up. Uh, and yet another theory says that they did this to demolish buildings and create more space. Another theory says that they burnt their buildings down as a way to honor their dead, but of course none of these can be confirmed due to the lack of evidence and we'll likely never know. 
I'm going insane saying that so much, but obviously it was an important practice to these people because it was always repeated. So I guess pick your favorite theory and run with that. Atlantis of the Sands. This is referring to a legendary lost city in the southern deserts, deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, thought to have been destroyed by natural disaster or as a punishment by God. But the city actually had a name. It was known as Ubar or Iram of the Pillars, and it was apparently lost found and then lost again almost like a phone charger or something i don't know how you lose and find then lose again a whole city unless it was a city full of people with alzheimer's which is very unlikely huh but i digress this city seems to mainly be thought of as a myth much like the place it was named after the sunken city of atlantis and is traced back to bedtime stories from the 9th century it's even largely responsible for the european romantic perception of arabia uh, as a place of harems, flying carpets, genies, and other magic items, this is the reason behind that. And on top of that, it was said to be a largely successful and wealthy city, and is even mentioned in the Quran. Also, much like the sunken city of Atlantis, this place has many theories surrounding it, as well as many claims of people saying that they have discovered the lost city. And fun fact, there was a mission where you have to explore this lost city in Uncharted 3. Cannabis Burial Shroud in China this is the first time archaeologists have unearthed well-preserved cannabis plants. I'm sure Snoop Dogg would like to get on on that and test it. And these ones were found buried along, well, alongside with a body and are said to be from 2,500 years ago. That's what I was trying to say. But preserved with this body were 13 of these cannabis, cannabis plants, each around 3 feet long and in very good condition for their age. And this discovery adds considerably to our understanding of how ancient Eurasian cultures used the plant for ritual and medicinal purposes, and how it was very popular among the Eurasian people thousands of years ago. And while other cannabis plants have been found in other nearby graves, this was the first example of complete cannabis plants being discovered. And archaeologists theorized that the plant was grown and harvested for its psychoactive resin, which was probably inhaled as an incense consumed in a beverage or used for ritual or medicinal purposes. Liquid mercury at Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan. I'm being told that's pronounced Teotihuacan. So Teotihuacan was a great city of the Mesoamericas in Mexico, known to the Aztecs as the City of the Gods. There's a lot of these City of the Gods I'm realizing now. But this place has bamboozled researchers for a long time. These researchers are really getting bamboozled, befuddled by a lot of these entries on here, I'm realizing as well. I'm realizing a lot of stuff right now. I'm having a mental breakdown. Anyways, the show goes on. It was very large, being the home for 120,000 people, and was built <coughs> around the famous Avenue of the Dead. <coughs> the show goes on. <coughs> The show goes on, and there are three pyramids that link the avenue. The Pyramid of the Sun, the Moon, and the Feathered Serpent. What the fuck is that word? Quetzalcoatl. And that last one I listed, I'm going! And the last one I listed is the most interesting to researchers because in 2003, they discovered a secret tunnel under the structure. And instead of finding buried treasure, they found things like crocodile teeth, jaguar sculptures, necklaces made of human teeth, a lot of teeth, jeweled odd figures, and many other weird but kind of cool things. Sorry, I had to take a break for water. I know I'm like the content monkey. I gotta keep clapping my symbols, so let's go. The most noteworthy of these discoveries, though, was a miniature mountainous landscape with pools of liquid mercury that were meant to depict lakes. And the walls of this secret tunnel were carefully infused with fool's gold, aka powdered pyrite, in order to reflect the mercury that created the effect of being surrounded by stars. A few archaeologists have also theorized that this subterranean tunnel may also depict a sacred underworld river that leads the way to the royal tombs, and considering some of the remains of powerful Teotihuacan kings were never found, this could be actually the under... Fuck, what am I saying? Considering some of the powerful Teotihuacan kings were never found, this underground river of metal may be the answer to that secret. But since these theorized tombs have never been found, we can't say for sure, and we just don't know what the purpose of this structure was. But maybe they were mysterious on purpose to make me go crazy. St. Thomas Silver Coins in India. 
This revolves around the biblical story where Judas received 30 pieces of silver in exchange for the arrest of Jesus. And this entry says that these silver coins actually still exist today in a place called Goa on the west coast of India. The four silver coins are referred to as Rakata Veli, or blood silver, for obvious reasons. Now, obviously, this story is solely based on word of mouth, so there is no proof that these coins really are the ones from the biggest, one of the biggest stories in the Bible. Also, the only source I could find is that of a personal account of a woman from Germany, so I can't take this story as fact. Don't take anything on this video as a fact. I don't even know if I'm saying the right information. I'm just saying words. But anyways, there wasn't much in the way of proof. Uh, they did take pictures and give an account of them having the coins examined by an acclaimed scholar, to which they said they can't be for sure if it's the exact coins. But he said it's definitely possible. So, <laughs> but that's a good answer. I can't say for sure that it is, but it's possible. Shut up. You're not a scholar. You're guessing. You're stupid. I'm not a scholar, and I could give them the same answer. If she walked up to me with those silver coins and said, are these the coins that, Je that Judas received to betray Jesus? I would say, I can't say for sure, but it's definitely possible, and it would hold just as much weight as what he told you, because it's the same sentence, the same sentiment. So this seems to boil down to, I believe these are the coins Judas received to snitch on Jesus. One scholar was neutral, so let's just go off my belief and say these are real. The Griffin Warrior Tomb. This one singular Greek tomb is causing archaeologists to wet their pants and change everything they thought they knew about the roots of Western civilization. This tomb was discovered near the ancient palace of Nestor on a hilltop near Palos on the southwest coast of Greece. Then, over the next six months, the archaeologists uncovered bronze basins, weapons, and armor, but also a tumble of even more precious items like gold and silver cups. I almost threw up. Hundreds of beads made of carnelia, amethyst, amber, and gold. More than 50 stone seals intricately carved with goddesses, lions, and bulls. And four stunning gold rings. Also, the warrior buried in the tomb was certainly a prominent, perhaps the most prominent, local leader of his generation. He ruled at the very beginning of the Mycenaean civilization when the magnificent great shift, magnificent shaft graves excavated by Heinrich Schliemann were being used for the burial of Mycenae, Mycenae's elite. And this turned out to be one of the biggest discoveries in Greece in more than half a century. Now, I wanted to go over this little interactive thing with you on the Smithsonian Magazine website because it's kind of cool and it lets me explain it way easier. You hover over the head and it shows just like a recreation of what they thought the warrior would have looked like. Uh, you got this right here, bullhead staff. Staff head held by a goddess in one of the gold rings. This right here is the necklace. Has box weave chain and two sacral avi finials at each end. You go down a little bit more. Bronze and gold daggers and sword used a rare faux gold embroidery techni technique. Four rings depict a goddess with a mirror, another with a staff, a rot at seaside shrine, and a male bull leaper. That's neat. Carved ivory comb suggests a ceremonial purpose, perhaps brushing long hair before battle. A bronze basin. Uh, you got your boar tusk, fortified Mycenaean helmets like Odysseus. A gold cup. Mirror's handle is adorned with carved ivory rosets. rossets. A bronze battle knife. A bronze spouted basin. Shows with other metalwork the warrior status. And then a bronze jug. That was everything found in this grave. There are over 1,500 objects in total, though, and researchers claim that the sky is the limit when it comes to what we are going to learn from these discoveries. So that's pretty neat. That's something to look forward to. Where is Jesus's foreskin? The entry I've been waiting for since I started this series. The holy foreskin. And, well, this holy foreskin is described as both an object and an idea. So it's also some philosophical foreskin that Jesus had. <laughs> but the whole idea states that since Jesus was a Jewish boy, he would have been circumcised when he was eight days old, as was the customs of the time. And there's actually mention of Jesus' circumcision in the Bible in the book, book of Luke 2.21. And these religions absolutely love getting their paws on things they believe connect to their beliefs, like part of the Holy Cross, or even a finger or toe of a saint, and this is the foreskin of their main dude, so I can only imagine the holy boners this discovery popped up back then. And I say back then because they apparently had possession of the foreskin until the sacking of Rome in 1527 that left half the population dead, but most tragic of all, 
they lost the sacred relics, the holy foreskin included in those relics. But according to researchers of that time, they worshiped this foreskin because it made Jesus all the more relatable and not just a character in a book. Although, of course, this foreskin can't actually be confirmed to have existed and also can't be confirmed to not just be some other random person's foreskin. So yeah, that's the foreskin entry. <laughs> Apollonius of Tyana. In the ancient world, he was referred to as a magician, a fraud, a scientist, and many even believed he was a divine figure who could save humanity. Many saw him as a pagan Jesus Christ, and he was even more popular than Jesus for a time in the Roman Empire. And much different from these other entries, we actually know a lot about this man, but the issue comes in the form of the knowledge that we have on him is actually reliable or not. We don't know if it's actually true or trustworthy. But going off that, it's believed he lived in the first century AD, although some believe he, he lived much later than that. Uh, and he was almost certainly born a Greek in Tyana, Roman Cappadocia, Cappadocia, which is now modern Turkey. And one of the main doctrines he taught was the idea of reincarnation. And he thought your previous life affected your next one, so he told his followers to not eat meat and not to commit violence for the best possible next life. He also preached chastity and not drinking alcohol, and he also believed in one supreme god, but prayers, rituals, and sacrifices were not required by this god, and instead he said meditation and reason could allow you to have a connection and unity with this supreme being. And on top of all that, he was of the belief that the earth revolves around the sun. So he was smarter than some people that are still alive today that think the earth is flat somehow. But there is more information about this dude, but I feel this entry was long enough and I got the main ideas across. Did God have a wife? Well, this entry says he did. And what people point to for proof is that in the book of Kings in the Bible, some someone named Asherah is being worshiped alongside the God of Israel Yahweh, Allah, or God. And on top of the ancient text, there have been some ancient artifacts uncovered that also support this idea and point to Asherah being a powerful virility, fertility goddess. One artifact is some pottery that has inscriptions on it that are asking for a blessing from Yahweh and Asherah and that shows the two as being a divine pair and that's pretty much it. Did God have a thing with Asherah where they banging like orangutans going at it? Who knows? I hope so. I hope God was getting some. Cromlech of Almendras, also known as Portugal Stonehenge, is a monument made up of nut-shaped stones, my voice is given out, aligned with the heavens. They were built over several different periods between 5000 and 4000 BCE. The stones are arranged in patterns of two concentric rings, an eastern circle and a larger oval to the west and they total 95 stones overall. The oldest part of this structure, the Eastern Circle, was built around 6,000 BCE, then the Western Oval was built around 5,000 BCE, and then around 3,000 BCE, many of the stones seem to have been repositioned to better align with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And as is natural with these ancient structures, its purpose is completely unknown. But whoever did make this site, they intentionally made it very geometrically sound and intentionally lined up these stones very precisely. Nidocris. Nidocris is said to be the first Egyptian queen, but did she actually exist? She would have reigned if she did exist sometime around 4,000 years ago, but her name only appears in writings no older than 2,400 years ago. But she left behind no discreet inscriptions, tomb, or even monuments, but an ancient writer, Manetho, from the 3rd century BC mentioned her, but Egyptologists, once again weird word, dismissed this idea that said she built the Third Pyramid. But another researcher suggests that she didn't build the Third Pyramid of Giza, but the Third Pyramid of Saqqara, which I don't even know what that is. There's even a debate about their gender, with some saying their name is a male name and she wasn't a female queen at all. And other Egyptologists, which still sounds so goofy saying that word out loud, but it sounds official, so whatever. But they say it's most likely that she was the wife of Manri Nemtiyamasof II who was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh that ruled for just one year after Pepi died. And the time she could have ruled is even all over the place, with some saying she ruled three years, or six years, or twelve years, and the ancient writer I mentioned a minute ago, Methano, Manetho, says she ruled for twelve years and that she was braver than men and physically beautiful. And that's all the detail he gives. 
That's also where I'm going to end this entry because it seems like everyone is just flinging, flinging their poopy theories at the wall and seeing which one sticks. The Lost Roman Legion in Liquian. In 53 BCE, the Roman army suffered a catastrophic loss at Parthia at the Battle of Carhae. And after this, they moved to the eastern front of the Parthian Empire before finding their way into battle with Chinese troops. And afterwards, these out-of-place legionnaires were moved by the Western Han Dynasty. My voice is dying, I regret screaming earlier. They moved them to a specifically created frontier city that the Chinese gave their name for Rome, Legion, now Liquian. And today, Liquian is a small village of earth-rammed homes located in Gansu province. And since the publication of A Rome City in China, that has led to many researchers visiting and coming up with theories, all trying to find the answer to, did a Roman legion settle in ancient China? Because this legion seems to have disappeared. And apparently the locals believe this story about the Romans, but no one can be for sure if the people there today are descendants from Romans or not. Although the DNA tests that have been done on the villagers do say they have foreign DNA, it doesn't automatically mean it's from the ancient Roman origin. So who knows what the true story is here, much like every other entry, it's driving me insane and making me lose my voice. But one thing is true, and that is that this story has caused this remote area to receive some tourism, and it seems like that's been good for the area, so we get a nice little fairy tale ending for this one. The Siberian Ice Maiden is a mummy of a tattooed Scythian Siberian noblewoman who is believed to have had supernatural powers, and the contents of her tomb in the Ukok Plateau in the Altai Mountains region in Russia, were completely embedded in ice, hence her name, the Ice Maiden, and it was only after melting the ice they realized that this burial was of an important person. And what was most astonishing was the state of preservation the body was in. Just look at that, it's pretty crazy. Uh, it was so well preserved that even the tattoos on her skin could be clearly seen. They came to find out her body was carefully embalmed using peat <clears throat> and bark, and was laid on its side as if she were asleep. She also was young and shaved bald and wore a wig and a tall hat, like those things in Spongebob almost, which her coffin was made longer to accommodate this hat wig. And her tattoos were of creatures with horns that evolved into floral shapes, and this ice maiden belonged to the Pazaric culture, which were a congregation of Scythian nomadic tribes that lived in the Ulta Mountains in the 6th to 3rd centuries BC. And researchers say she was most likely a healer or a shaman, and she periodically inhaled fumes of copper and mercury, which would have been very harmful to her health, but in 2010, they discovered that she had died from breast cancer that killed her in about three years, and she was 25 at the time of her death. The last entry! I'm almost free! Might as well get rid of my voice right now, I'll just keep yelling, Derek. Uh, the last entry, though, is Yonaguni Monument. This is Japan's ancient underwater pyramid that has absolutely befuddled scholars! <laughs> but located lying just below the waters of the Yonaguni Jima are submerged stone structures that are actually the ruins of a Japanese Atlantis, or an ancient city that was sunk by an earthquake about 2,000 years ago. That's at least the theory of Masaki Kimura, a marine biologist who has been diving at the site to measure and map information about for about 15 years. And apparently every time he returns to dive to the dive boat, he is more convinced than ever that below him rests a 5,000 year old city. Also according to him, the largest structure looks like a complicated monolithic stepped pyramid that rises from a depth of 25 meters or 82 feet, but of course, just like every other sunken city story, this one has a lot of controversies. Quote, I'm not convinced that any of the major features or structures are man-made steps or terraces, but that they're all natural, said Robert Scotch, a professor of science and mathematics at Boston University who has dobbed at the site. But the people who do believe it's a sunken city believe that the structures could be all that's left of Mu, a fabled Pacific civilization rumored to have vanished beneath the waves. And even Kimura himself initially thought that this was all purely natural, but he changed his mind after diving the first time at the location, saying, quote, I think it's very difficult to explain away the origin as being purely natural because the vast amount of evidence of man-made influences 
of man's influences on the structures. This evidence includes character and animal monuments in the water, and even rudimentary characters etched onto carved rock faces. Quote, whoever created the city, most of it apparently sank in one of the huge seismic events that this part of the Pacific Rim is famous for, Kimura said. Also, there have been similar structures on a nearby coast that have charcoal dated back to about 1600 years ago, which could support the ancient inhabitants theory, but according to the expert diver in this area, Kimura, the, he says, quote, the best way to get a definitive answer about their origins is to keep going back and collecting more evidence. So that's what he keeps continuing to do. And he follows that up by saying, quote, if I'd not had a chance to see these structures for myself, I might be skeptical as well. And that's it. It's finally over. No outro. Just click off the video. I'm done. Freedom.